We're starting the meeting. Oh, when? Right now. <laughs> and I have, you'll have to excuse me. I was on a flight to the beginning of July, wore my mask. Other people did not. I got COVID, so I am COVID free, but my body's not releasing me from it. So if I start coughing too much, I'm going to ask Brian to take over. Thank you for your patience. And um, Eric, do we have any uh, agenda changes or additions? We do. If uh, under number six, where it says approved contract for Sexton, the new Sexton's name is Chris Young. I would ask you to add another line to roll back to uh, 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 appoint Chris Young as your agent to be real estate in all of the cemeteries as part of the duty. Under which one? Uh, under number six. Okay. It'll, it'll be an additional motion <laughs> okay. to number six for the follow on that. Okay. And then as a continuation of the two of the practices that we had adopted last fall as a result of the staffing of the police department, we, we uh, could we uh, continue the police sign-on bonus for this fiscal year. We, uh, we approved it last fall uh, in order to help to bolster the hiring of the police certified officers in the department. It was uh, successful for us to do. We were still having staffing issues. We're looking to continue that practice for this fiscal year. So our uh, motion uh, to approve it would be to approve that uh, through the end of fiscal year 23. So would that be number eight? Certainly. And then number nine, follow that. At the same time you approve the sign-on bonus, you approve uh, for Officer Andy Glover, who was the desk officer at the police department, when he would come out to work patrol to fill open shifts uh, that he would step onto the patrol pay scale for that shift that he was working instead of the desk officer shift, which is less. So he would receive a higher rate of pay when he was doing patrol duties versus his administrative duties. That's it, Eric? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'd like to uh, look at our minutes from our last meeting to approve them. Do I hear a motion? I make a motion with approval. A second? All second. Any discussion? They look good. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? I guess everybody said aye. So the minutes have passed. Liquor control? No. None? Thank you. New business. We have a presentation by Derek Raddick, Morgan Stanley Rep. Yes? Me. Okay, thank um, you. So I have a handouts here. Don, you, yep. There's some extras of just the PowerPoint slides there. But if you can just pass them. There's okay. a top, the top one here, the thicker one, has a bunch of disclaimer. So if you have at least one copy of all of that. Um, but really so is there just, one package for each person? Yeah. So thank you. Exactly. Can we just pass them down? Yep. Yep. Do you have one? Yep. I don't know. Do you have one? I do. Okay, one's for Brian. Or for Bob. Okay, so uh, the reason for my presence today really is just to answer a few questions, try to provide some clarity on how the more sensitive library endowment is managed and what, you know, over the years, how that income is generated and ultimately scheduled to be paid out. Yeah, those are extras. So historically, uh, the income that's generated in the endowment fund has been, you know, anywhere in the neighborhood from three and a half to five percent. And at any given time, we'll get various requests to pay out um, you know, for various library expenses. And for the last like, seven out of eight years, there's been a deficit in terms of how much income which would be 
the dividends and interest that the securities are generating and the expenses ultimately that end up getting paid out. So in a year where the market's down, that ends up adding more stress on the portfolio. And ultimately what ends up happening is you end up reducing the income for future years. If you end up <laughs> selling a piece of the portfolio that generates say $1,000 a year, and that piece of the portfolio is gone, now there's $1,000 less to be generated. Now, every endowment's different, but for the most part, you're paying out the income. Some, if there's continued gifting or contributions to an endowment, you might pay a portion of principal, maybe one or two percent, or it's a combination of an average annualized return, but not say, I think it was after COVID, there was a very large increase in the asset value from the fiscal year, June 20 to 21. And what I think maybe adds some confusion to that is there's a say $400,000 increase and now there's a lot more to be paid out, but that's not actually how it works because as I mentioned, if we sell these income producing assets now, <clears throat> and it's based on what the previous year was, well, the market right now, thankfully the portfolio isn't, but the market's down over 20%, even the bond market, which is your safer assets, are down over 10%. So forward-looking, what we have, what I have, and I'll point out in a second is, you end up, if we look at the last eight years, eight years ago, there was about $63,000 in income generated. The forward-looking amount is 52000 because we've been running the deficit the majority of the years, and so we're having to sell assets. Now we have less income that is being generated. Um, so if we look at page under the, uh, it's going to be titled upper right, sorry, upper left quadrant, income and distribution. Summary. Uh, Page three of eight. Yes, yeah. income distribution summary. The highlighted portion in the middle. Uh, if we just look at the rolling, it says a rolling 12 months. So this is looking back at 2014, 2015, which is before we started running a deficit. Um, and what you see at the very bottom is the total income that was generated over those 12 months was $63,000 and change. And if we look down below, in the lower right-hand side that's highlighted, the projected income looking forward the next 12 months is 52000 So the more we sell from the endowment's principal, the less income is going to be there in future years. Um, and in, in this case, obviously with the market being down, it's even more harmful to the portfolio because now we're selling assets at a loss and there's no way to make there's no way to make that up. So if we have some sort of mandate from another endowment or say other scholarships that we manage, Terrell Foundation, for certain years there's more income so we can pay out more scholarships. But ideally some there's some sort of growth or continued contributions so that we can pay out some combination of principal the interest and income and the principal. Um, but we want to be mindful of that core, the body of the, of the endowment, and to try to really limit how much we're feeding into the principal. Can you, can you tell us where, um, where it shows us what the principal is currently? Is that a number that you have? Or is that always in front? So on um, the other side, the next page, and actually this is titled, to mm -hmm. the bottom. What we see here is over the last 12 months, so in the upper right, we had a value of 1.78 million. The endowment has taken out $75,000 mm -hmm. in distributions, but if you look the very next line item below, where the uh, endowment generated 57,000 in, in income. Mm -hmm. So again, another deficit. Um, meanwhile, 
the endowment itself is down $245,000 on, on top of that. So now the value of the endowment is $1,525,000. Mm -hmm. And the account, the, the portfolio is down much less than the overall market. So we're thankful for any hot performance, but at the same time, um, when you have to take distributions based on, say, what was, we can always provide an estimate, even mid-month, end of the month, what it might look like over the next 12 months. So we can have these ongoing uh, levels of communication with Morristown Centennial Library. If we make this adjustment, this is how it's going to affect the income moving forward. And ideally, we want to have some form of income and growth, because the ultimate goal is, at some point, more and more of the income can pay for more and more of the library's expenses. But we would need the, the endowment to grow organically and you know, maybe with some additional gifting, but that's where we're at right now. And if we look at you know, right now, in part because of how the portfolio and where some of the initial assets came from, how they were gifted into the portfolio, it was a lot of union bank stock. And with that, at certain times, the, the level of the asset value is where it was five years ago, six years ago, because of some overexposure to a particular asset that, you know, sometimes these have mandates where they have to remain a certain percent. If someone is gifting something, they might want it to stay in a given endowment or scholarship. And so we work within those confines and have ongoing dialogue with the board about what this might look like you know, for future years and how can we further accommodate, but not continue to put you know, undue stress on the portfolio. So is this pretty typical, the 75,000? Is that pretty typical what you're selling every year? Um, this, was, this is a higher amount than usual. How much um, would normally be sold in a year? Probably, uh, and the average has probably been in the neighborhood of 50 to 60,000. Um, but last year was, was a little bit lower. And then the years before that, I think there was probably an average of about a $15,000 deficit. So, um, and thankfully in most of those years, uh, the majority of the, por the portfolio had appreciated, but you have two things going on. One was we had, we've had record low interest rates. So some of the income producing pieces of the endowment, maybe the bonds, the safer assets were paying four or five, 6%. Well, eventually those bonds mature. They have to go out and buy new bonds that are maybe paying two and a half, three, four percent. So there's two things going on. One is the bonds aren't paying as much as they used to, and we've had to sell assets that are no longer able to pay income. Um, and then obviously we anticipate with a rise in interest rates, you'll start getting paid a little bit more of the bonds, but that takes some years to work into the portfolio. Um, and that's why you know we'll continue to give updates to the Morristown Centennial Library about it where we're at on a regular basis, um, and they will give us a pretty decent heads up in what their income needs are and when they will need them, and then you know we'll plan accordingly. So the sales are being removed from the portfolio, and I assume the income is being removed from the portfolio on a yearly basis? Correct. So the portfolio is declining mm -hmm. with time? It has been, you know, <laughs> this year, because of a you know, again, an outsized distribution. Uh, thankfully, you know, majority of the income needs were, we were notified of it before the portfolio lost significant value. Um, so we weren't necessarily, there, there were areas that we could sell assets from that weren't necessarily a loss, but it, it's why it's important for us, important for the library to have some uh, advanced discussions on what the anticipated needs are. So the further we can plan ahead, the better off for the portfolio and for the endowment. So just one more question. Has this been going on for a while or is this a recent phenomenon? The uh, decline in the portfolio. So there were 
prior to the last several years, there were years where there was a there was a surplus, and if they if those funds weren't needed, they were reinvested into the portfolio. But for what the budget, I believe, has been, um, I think that it's six or seven of the last seven or eight years. And it might have been as small as $4,000 of a deficit. And that was, in most cases, the portfolio made money. But we just, from the standpoint of how um, sustainable the income can be moving forward, that's where the investment policy comes into play. Thanks. So if I can provide some context just to back us up for a second. We were here last year during the budget season and we kind of described to the select board that we felt like upward pressure on the endowment was not an appropriate mechanism for funding the library. We're a nonprofit incorporated library. A board manages our endowment. The select board doesn't have any authority or control over that endowment, but we supplement the budget for the public library so that taxpayers in Morrisville pay less per capita than average citizens in other towns because we have that fund to utilize. Unfortunately, given the other budget context and circumstances, we were level funded. And um, level funding, you know, when you have a COLA increase that occurred this summer um, for our employees to keep folks paid at parity with other jobs in the area, et cetera, et cetera, still means there's upward pressure on our budget to come up with funds that we don't have access to. We don't have budget flexibility once the budget is set to ask for more money from the town taxpayers should we have a deficit that is necessary. In having that conversation, a few things became clear. One is that um, there's been this deficit that we've been running for a number of years. And the numbers that were given to the select board in an email are the numbers that are being shown in this chart to you, the 12 month comparison numbers. That was what we showed you for eight years in a row. The reason we're using the word deficit is that the money we use as a metric or a touchstone for what's available for that endowment withdrawal to support our budget is against income. The word income here does not mean what it means for everyone who has a retirement account. I earned a lot of money on my entire retirement account, and I can draw down from all of that interest this much if I'm going to live for the next 20 years. It actually means that there is a number of funds that Derek was describing that we earn an annual dividend amount. That dividend amount is what you're seeing projected and historically, 12 months backwards and also showing you five years ago, as a comparison, we've lost that income over time because we're, we're taking money out of the account at, a, at an excess level. We're taking too much of the principal um, account stocks and, and therefore cutting into our income. So those deficits are against the amount we budget for in planning from our endowment of what we can withdraw. So if we were prudently taking the advice of our investment advisors, the amount that you see there for the next 12 months, that 52,000 and change number, that would be what we can come into the town and ask for, an appropriation that makes up for the remainder of our budget besides the 52,000 and change withdrawal on the endowment. So that would be the prudent thing for us to do. That number is vastly lower than the amount of money that we've been asked to take from the endowment for almost a 10 year period now. Our endowment <laughs> contribution has been increasing with inflation and with other costs, just as the tax appropriation amount has been increasing um, because our budget is increasing, just like everyone's budgets are increasing with ex excessive costs and with increasing payroll, et cetera. And so we're here to try to explain the context for that conversation and where we we're coming from in terms of what does the word income mean? It does not mean asset value, which is what you'd see in an audit report. Asset value, and Derek can explain this better than I can, is about, it's an estimate. It's an estimate of the current value of the assets in the account. Even if you sold them all in the same second, it wouldn't actually amount to that amount of money probably, and that's not advisable for anyone to do. But at the same time, if you're gonna sell some portion of that to make up for the amount that we need above, like, so let's say the 52,000, we're cutting into that income number as time goes forward, yeah. and we're not an institution that receives regular contributions or gifts from folks in the community. It's been a couple of decades since we got a gift that um, you know helps us with the principal investments in our account. We are not like a retirement account. We don't make annual contributions for a 30-year period and then have a, a short 
discrete period that we have to fund. We are a, a, an endowment that is supposed to last, preserve the library, to foster the library in perpetuity. And so we have different fiduciary responsibilities, and we use the word income, the concept of income here, as a metric for measuring that. And so this is to both familiarize the select board with where we're at and what this de running a deficit has caused <coughs> in terms of our forward-looking prospects for how we can budget coming up on the budget season, but why that is, and why we are at risk of jeopardizing the vitality of the endowment going forward if we continue on this track of just saying, here's the budget amount, here's the amount we do tax appropriation on, whatever percentage, and here's the amount then percentage for the endowment to take up the, the rest of the tax. We can't continue on that piece, or we'd be violating our fiduciary responsibility and preservation of the endowment. And unfortunately, this market circumstance that we're in right now is not helping that situation at all, as I'm sure you're all aware from all the endowments and trusts that you hear from. So we're here to sort of try to answer that question and also recharacterize, I think, what was a confusing conversation about what income meant in this context as how we measure income and what it means for us to be operating in a deficit, as opposed to what you see in the audit report, which is an asset valuation that is based on a uh, snapshot in time that actually predates the budget season by a year and nine months and actual spending two years and almost 10 months, meaning the budget process, as you all know, is for nine months in the future, but the audit report data itself goes back in time another year because we're taking, we're capturing out of the previous fiscal year when we do the audit. So we're using an asset value that reflects something that in terms of planning is frankly irrelevant to the planning of what the endowment can um, endure for that budget season. And in, in fact, it's difficult to even project. Like I said, we don't have the same flexibility, so we have to work within those circumstances to give the select board and the town voters an understanding of what's available to us at that time in terms of information and funding. I'm, I appreciated you giving the brief history because I was sitting there trying to think about how I was going to do that, but you did it much better than I could ever have done that. And I know who you are, but just for the record, could you introduce yourself? I'm Steph Hoffman. I'm the treasurer of the library board. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Stephanie? Yeah, I do. Is, can we entertain from the audience? I'm not quite sure. For the presentation, that's fine. I, Tell, yeah, go. Okay, I, can I ask a question first? Please? Sure, go ahead. Um, so, Steph, I'm wondering, um, if if we're looking, are we looking at solutions today, or um, is the library looking at solutions for, or um, just presenting the picture? Because what I'm what I'm hearing and thinking is, um, is that um, the income generated um, is less than what you need, and so I'm assuming that means that you'll be asking for more money from the town and from the taxpayers, um, and then my question from there is. Um, and I want to preface that with for I want to preface that with I, I love the library and I think it's absolutely worth it. Um, I want to also ask what other um, you're saying that there's there's been no additional gifting and there's been no additional um, additions to the um, endowment besides the income generated um, from those assets. Um, is it possible? Like, have you thought about doing? Um, you know, looking for gifts and looking for um, fundings to bolster the <coughs> endowment to um, to continue growing that in another way. So the answer to your second question is always we're yeah. always looking. The gifting process is a lot more complicated than the other fundraising we do. We do you know annual fundraising as a board in right. various ways throughout the right. year. It's really about, frankly, historically at least, it's about people giving large gifts either right. when someone yes. passes away. Mm -hmm or worked at the library for their whole life and late in life they're giving a gift is, you know, maybe they don't have children or they want as part of their end of life plan to donate to the library. It's not something that is easily tactfully approached necessarily um, in terms of solicitation of that. It's more about the way we carry ourselves in the community and the relationships we build with folks such that the people who then involved with the library for a lifetime may be approaching that sort of decision later on, and then they'll approach us. Um, it's an awkward posture to be direct soliciting those types of, oh, yeah. of endowment gifts. 
Um, we do fundraise. We do fundraise, mm -hmm. yes. As a board, we fundraise in other ways. Um, that offsets, you know, the budgetary costs I should have said are in three buckets. There is right. a bucket that has to do with fundraising and with our own generation of funds as well, which is fairly sizable. Mm -hmm. um, to your first question, I'm not prepared to offer a solution or um, one uniform solution. I think you're thinking of this in the right way, and I think we're trying to pre-plan uh, as best we can to what that presentation looks like. I think coming in and saying we need more money isn't the right solution in and of itself. There might be graduated ways of approaching this problem, but we're facing on the flip side the cliff. We <coughs> talked about that cliff when we were here last December, which is um, if we do not appropriately care for the endowment, it will go away. And uh, the cost to Morristown taxpayers to fund the library of this size is three to five times as much per capita as they're currently paying. And that would happen all at once. So we, of course, I think in conjunction with the town, do not want that result. We want a plan that feels something like something our taxpayers can shoulder and that the endowment can shoulder. And we've kind of been putting too much of that weight on the endowment for the last seven, eight years, um, and we need to think, I think, creatively and strategically about how to get us out of this situation. And and so there, Mike, and I'll just follow up on that. You're here just presenting the information to us because of the discussion we had back in, I think it was last fall, during the budget season. Yeah, it started in the fall, right. and it continued through, the, through January, and from our takeaways on that, we thought it would be really important to have Derek here to answer some of the very nitty gritty questions about the endowment and explain these terms and concepts as we're using them because they're used differently in different you know, financial circumstances. The other thing is, we thought having this conversation outside of budget season would feel less pressure. Um, so we're here to kind of have a continuing dialogue about this and hopefully when we come in with our budget in December, uh, this isn't something that's a shock, it's something that we've been talking about for a long time. All right. Does anybody else on the board have any questions? Yeah, Tony. Tony? Yeah. So I was, could a, you, no, could I was you a no vote uh, 20 years ago when they wanted to expand the library. And they wanted to expand it a lot better than what it was, right across the street. So what I want to know now is, <clears throat> evidently the library is too big for the money to come in. And what, where does it stop? Okay? No. And, hold on. Okay. I ride by that library. I went to that library as a kid. Mm -hmm. I ride by that library, and I see the front doors are all closed up. And I don't, I don't understand that. So we got, we got a big building there, and we have no money to pay for it now. And 20 years ago, mm -hmm. the building was perfectly fine. I think, I don't, I don't know, Tony, I don't want to put our presenters on a spot because they weren't, they were coming here to prepare to, to talk no, to us about wanted, the plan. I just want to muck it in the mud now for... And this isn't about, um, this is just about the needs of the library because the endowment, and if we draw down from the endowment, we're not going to have the money available in, let's say, 20 years to keep it at the condition it is right now. Mm -hmm. So that's what this is all about. And I think maybe your question might be better answered during the budget session. Um, okay, no problem. And could you introduce yourself? Tony Cody. Thank you. Thank you. From Cody Hill. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I lived on Richmond Street for 15 years as a kid. So I went to that library a lot. Okay. Thank I just, I'm going to answer one of your questions. Is that the front doors are not being used anymore. So you, don't have those on them. you enter, can't be used. Well, you enter the, the library from the side where the parking lot is. And that, that's how you enter the library. So you can you can call the library and ask them questions about all of that, because I, that's all I know beyond that. So thank you for your presentation. Well, it's a perfectly beautiful building. It's a be beautiful building. And there's no door handles on it. It, it may have something to do with um, handicap access, but I'm yes. not sure. Yeah, yeah because sure. there's a, um, there's a handicap accessible door, and it's not possible in the front. I understand that. I understand that. It, and the in the front, um, I I went to the library as a kid too, and um, that that whole front section is just the same as it used to be. It's gorgeous in there. Yes, lovely. Um, and the and the basement, which used to be kind of like stacks and maybe a little like stuffy and like microfiche and stuff, is now like a whole kids area, 
and it's um, really great. So like all the like loud toddler running around kids are contained down there, and then more of the adult stuff happens upstairs. So that's what I can say. About yeah. That, right? yeah. I just, just want to say thank you for the presentation, and this is very helpful just very, to kind yeah. of understand the, the big <clears throat> picture. And, and I'll just say, you know, if the, if this town wants to keep <clears throat> the town wants to keep this library <laughs> and all the things that it does, and obviously the library is doing a tremendous amount of good for this community. I think, you know, it's it's clearly going to behoove us all to maintain this portfolio yeah. as best mm -hmm. we can in the future. Just a reminder and asking people to sign in and um, even before you leave, that'd be helpful. Thank you. And actually, if I could just um, add a couple, uh, I guess a little more historical piece to this. You know, when we, Morgan Stanley, uh, Becky Braddock, Omar Braddock, myself, we've been managed, we've helped out with the building fund originally to help expand the library and we've been managing the endowment for over 20 years. And if I just, just glance at a piece of paper here, in, from 2012 to 2015, we were, it was averaging about $40,000 in income. We had surplus those years where the, in 2012, they took 20,000 out. 2013, 25,000. 2014, 30,000. So the needs went up and the income still was outpacing that and was able to be reinvested. So it can make a dramatic difference, even if we're just talking about uh, reinvest, having the income reinvest and the part of the portfolio that is just pure growth. Because there's some pieces of portfolios where they don't pay a dividend, right? But they appreciate <coughs> like a Google or Amazon. They don't pay a dividend. They go up. It's eventually, those get to a price where there's a rebalancing. So you can't take profit from the outsized growth, transfer that into the income producing pieces of the portfolio, and increase the income that way. Mm -hmm. But if you are withdrawing from principal and income, and we add in certain bonds aren't paying as much income. You know, there's just there's layers to this, and we thought it would be helpful just to try and explain some of the different moving parts. And if there's more information that I can provide at a later date, I'm, I'm happy to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda, accept that resignation of Jack Zach exactly. Lay. Exactly. This was an oversight on my part last the uh, last meeting to do an add-on for this. Uh, so this is a follow-up just to, to close the door here. Zach uh, was a part-time paid member of our uh, rescue squad and uh, he has taken a full-time employment elsewhere and his uh, email or resignation uh, sent to uh, Bill Mace is enclosed in your packet. This is just a promotion to accept his do I hear a motion? I'll, I'll make a motion we approve it. I'll second. Yes. Well, thank you. Motion and a second. Any discussion? So we have a motion with a thank you. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So the motion passed. Third on the agenda is approved release of employment of Jacques Marco, PD. Doctors uh, moving on to a new occupation, and uh, this is a, a vote to uh, approve the rules of his appointment. Okay, George. Yeah, I got a motion that we release Jacques Marcoux from his duties as a town employee due to circumstances beyond his control. Second. I have a um, here a motion and a second. Any discussion? Again, thank you. Another thank you. Yeah. All those in favor? Someone is in favor of that. <laughs> no, it's, it's not um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. A motion has passed. Next on the agenda, discuss and approve bid proposal for a highway truck and plow. And I think Matt is going to be discussing that with us. Yeah. Would you like to come forward, Matt? I'll stand down. Okay. Yeah. Could you introduce yourself, please? Matt Fredericks. Thank you. Um, we've chose 
and kind of decided that going from an F-350 down to an F-250 was kind of economically better for us. We don't need the one ton pickup. We're more suited for a three quarter ton. Um, we went from a diesel to a gas because of all the emission stuff that comes with all these new vehicles. And for the small amount that we run around this town, slow speed, it wasn't really working for the diesels. Um, we've had some small issues with it, and there's a lot more expensive now. Oil changes, the air filters, and everything else. So we went with the gas, and we went down to an F-250. Now, is this the information we have um, from Lebanon, Eric, in yes. our packet? That's correct. Okay. And we just have the one bid, or we have the one. We also had a hard time finding a truck within a year, year and a half. So I kind of reached out, and we kind of like to stick with the color red. Another <laughs> problem. So I did find one, and then Kevin's been dealing with that since just we did find it. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions for Matt? Well, I was going to ask about the bids because I like to see the three bids. Um, I understand you can't do supply chain issues. Pardon? Supply chain Pardon? issues. Supply. Yeah. Yeah, it's with everything that we're trying to get at this point, whether it's a big truck or a small truck or anything else. I make a motion. We approve Lebanon Ford as the sole source vendor for the purchase of a 2022 Ford F-250 Super Duty for a total purchase price of 36587 This includes a seven-year warranty, funds to be borrowed for the truck and plow for a five-year term, and additionally to authorize Eric Dodge to sign on, on this uh, purchase. I'll second that. Any discussion? So and this um, this quote includes the trade in for the um, we're trading in the old vehicle. The trade in, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Cool. Now, did you say that price is a plow too? No, the plow is separate. Separate, yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. So does that have to be a different motion? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we have a a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion is passed. And um, so then we have to go to the plow, right? Yes, Do you want a motion right away? Oh, yes, please. So I move that we approve the purchase of a plow for the 2022 Ford F-250 Super Duty from Stowe Road Auto for a total price of $8,551. And that we authorize Eric Dodge to sign on this purchase. I'll second that. Any discussion? So is this to be financed over seven years as well? Yes, it's a package. We, we, we take the loan out for both the truck and the plow together. But I wanted you to vote on the plow separately because there was a second bid on the plow. So I wanted you to see that. Even though okay. the one you just voted for is the lower price. Okay. It's, this is already in the budget? Yes. Actually, it's under budget. Yay. Okay. Thank you, Tina. So we have a motion and a second, right? Yeah. It's already done. And um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion is passed. And the next on the agenda, appoint second member of the LCPC board, Steve Foster, a new applicant. Hi, would you like to stand up and introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Steve Foster, I'm currently a member of the uh, planning council um, and I'm seeking the appointment for the LCPC board. I think it's a great opportunity continue to serve the community. Um, I will, if you have any questions for me, please feel free to ask. Otherwise, I do appreciate your consideration. Will you be continuing to serve on the planning council as well? I am. Great. Any questions for Steve? That was my question. Be <laughs> you. <laughs> so do I, do I hear a, uh, do you want, we'll do it during the discussion. Do I hear a motion? I make a motion we appoint Steve Foster to the Moyle County Planning Council. I second. 
Okay. Any discussion? Sharon? Would you Sharon. like to introduce yourself? Oh, Sharon Rowell. I just have to see. You keep hearing this. See, is it that if somebody lives out of town, can they be serving on the boards? Where does that, where does that stand right now? I'm, Let, not, I'm not disputing him going on the board. Right. Kind of plan. Let, let's answer that question after we vote on this because it's kind of. I don't think. Well, where, where, where is it appropriate for me to ask? Uh, we can answer that after we'll do the vote. Okay. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. On the on the board, on the board. I, I think what you're referring to is our is our joint committee rules, which are different than the planning council rules. So the two are not um, tied to each other. Um, and what what I'm seeing is a, a seat on the planning uh, county planning council, opposed to a joint committee, which would be. The, the the planning commission. So, so and and the I can't switch. So you're so you're right. We did go through a whole um, back and forth, <clears throat> and we did change the um, the rules for the subordinate committees. Um, so basically, what we landed on after going back and forth a little bit with the um, the village trustees um, is that if um, if first we'll look at candidates that are Morristown and Morrisville residents. And um, they will give, be given top priority, but then um, either if, if someone's already serving on the board that lives out of town, they're grandfathered in. Um, and then if um, uh, if we can't find someone who is a Morristown resident, we can also consider someone who lives outside of town. I would like to clarify, I'm sorry, Sharon, didn't mean to interrupt, but yeah. the Water Cosmetic Commission is not- It's not a subordinate board, board. So right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I, I currently live in <laughs> and does the village trustees do they vote on this appointment to LCPC? No. no. So it's not a joint appointment. Either. No, it is not. Because okay. they the the trustees oh, that's right. have not. not the they have, they haven't joined LCPC. Okay, I think. Were there others seeking? That? What's that? Were there others that were seeking that? The LCPC. See, that's one of the things that's a problem. Yeah, you know, we keep we, we keep trying to push people away, and yet we have people that not enough. Yeah, I understand. I just but yes. I don't have that question answered. No. Right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, if I recollect correctly, correctly, at our last meeting, Judy's name was the only name on the docket for appointment mm -hmm. to LCMC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We haven't had people beating down the doors. Okay. Not yet. Thank you. <laughs> We're hoping that happens. <laughs> Yes. Well, I, I'm just, you know, I just Thank have you. a question about, um, I'm thinking we're at a different time with our, um, the development of our town and, and, you know, different things that people are concerned about that maybe if we put it out on a front porch forum or somewhere about interested people, um, it does seem like, you know, in my life work as a therapist, we have something called a conflict of interest. And so we really have to be careful about um, how we do business sometimes. So I'm wondering if we could get it out there, maybe we wouldn't have I think I would challenge you and say I don't I don't know what the conflict of interest would be. I think you would want somebody to advocate for the town on the board that understands the current planning condition of, of the other board. You know, to have a to have a, a, a sense of a unity between what's happening in our current zoning regulations and what's happening at the county level might actually be beneficial. To the community, more beneficial than somebody disengaged from that process. I, I can tell you, Jessica, that the, the the it's a regional planning commission, so it it's talking about the whole region: Johnson, Hyde Park, Stowe. So it isn't just Morrisville. We're just a, a member and a part, and have um, have a voice at the table, have a seat at the table is the most important thing to have representation there. So um, I know Eric's been able to take advantage of the, opp the um, opportunities that they have provided for our town and guidance and um, grant writing and information. So it, it, it's a real benefit for our town just to be sitting there. And, and uh, my point is just that we have a lot of people that live here now. And, and let's make use of our population. Right. Just, yeah. We don't all have, you know, just be, let's put it out there. That's, mm -hmm. that's really my point. And, and I wasn't saying it was a conflict for you. I'm saying that, like, you know, you're going to see too as a realtor, there's a lot of things 
happening. So let's make use of our, our we have a ton of really intelligent people. I'd, I'd like to see some more representation. So maybe yeah. appropriate that I throw a plug out for our list. Yes. As a, as a result of the redo of our Good. Uh, smart boards guidance that we have, uh, there is a list maintained by my assistant duty and an email, phone call, conversation uh, over the counter can get your name on the list if you're interested in any board or a specific board. And that list is maintained with us at any time, any time there's a vacancy. Uh, in fact, we have two names on the list right now. One specifically would like to serve on the DRD if an opening happens. And the other one is showing interest in the planning council. Um, so that, that, that's all we have on us right now is just two names. So anybody is welcome to, to reach out to us uh, at any time, whether there's a vacancy or not. Thank and you. Um, they should email, um, what's the email address? J.L.Berry. Admin. 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 Admin at Admin at Okay, thanks. Jamie, did you have a I question? I have a quick question. Uh, when it comes to the representatives of the LCPC, yourself and, and presumably Steve, See? um, are they voting uh, as representatives you know, on behalf of the select board, or are you too free to vote your conscience as you see fit? I'm voting as a representative from the town. Okay. So what's directing your vote? The select board? How, how are you? How are you? I think what, how I feel it's benefiting the town. And a lot of the voting is... Hmm. It's it's region it's region wide. Okay. I just felt as though yeah. there was a comment the in the previous meeting, whereas yeah. the people in these positions were acting at the behest of the select board. Uh, was sort of my understanding. If that's not the case, and, and you folks are free to vote on your own volition. Um, and I and I offhand I can't remember anything that I voted on that directly uh, affected the town. I, okay. off, off the top of my head, it could have happened. Okay. But most of it is. Um, a cell tower going up in Johnson or Hyde Park or someplace like that. So it's it's more of regional planning. Okay. Thank you. LCPC wouldn't normally have select board members on the board, would it? That's a good question. Um, I don't know everybody's um, position on the board in their community. Um, I know right now Duncan Hot Hastings is a select board member in Johnson, and he's on the LCPC. So there is at least one other one. Okay. But it's not like some kind no, of... No, it isn't necessary, like no. <clears throat> Kathy, Katie, I have a question for Eric off what you just said about getting on the list. Um, is there term limits on the other boards like there is select boards? There is not. So it's hard for somebody to get on that board if somebody doesn't want to step down then. Not necessarily. I, I think you're going to find that... Uh, we're, we're coming up on a time of changeover in the next year, and I think you're going to see that there's quite likely to be vacancies. Um, it's a planning council, and there's a possibility for vacancies there. It's, it's, uh, it, it's not a, a, a given that these folks have spent 40 years. Paul Trudell was kind of an anomaly. Uh, he's been on our, our DRD for over 30 years that I'm aware of. But by and large, most folks serve for, I, I, I would say, less than 10 years, and then they, have other interest the families taking different directions. So it's not a foregone conclusion, it's not the Supreme Court. They're not there for life. So there is definitely an opportunity. And there was discussion on that. Did, you, did it end up where there was not going to be any term limits? No. No. One, and I have to go back to my notes. Uh, the question was asked a while ago when I, uh, I called Jim Barlow, our, our municipal law uh, attorney. One of the boards, and this is where I don't want to put it one of the one of the boards, you can put in term limits, the other one you cannot. And I don't know which one is which. Okay, let's go back to we're gonna vote on Steve. Do we hear a vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 So it passed. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so approve the contract for Sexton. So we have uh, Chris Young, who is uh set forward. He is a, a part-time employee of the Public Use Cemetery, working with my day up there on the ground maintenance. And found that we were in need of a section we have been for some time now. Uh, but Sexton is in, uh, in charge of managing the function, not necessarily the grounds. They have in that cemetery, they have my day who oversees the maintenance, the grass cutting, and so on and so forth. 
but it's the the sexton's position is there to coordinate efforts with funeral directors and monument folks mm -hmm. families uh, the selling of lots uh, the opening and closing of graves there's a tremendous amount to it more than most folks would understand um, or, or just have general knowledge of it's really something that's not <coughs> the books out there to read on but uh, every community section position really is handled a little differently uh, they're all kind of unique and the same at the same time so chris uh, showed an interest uh, the two cemetery association uh, board presidents were present for a uh, discussion with him and had the uh, questions of him and He's very, very interested uh, in the position, has agreed to uh, a contract, uh, a contract price of $15,000 per year. And uh, that's the contract that's in front of you. Okay. So this- not, He's not an employee of the town, he's a contractual. Okay, and so what we're, what we're looking at right now is just the uh, contract for any sexton right now. Yes, okay. and he, because uh, we had to uh, appoint Chris Young for the cemetery. So. You'd be, if you were to approve this, you would be authorizing me to sign on behalf of the town for, on the contract. That's Sexton's position contract that's listed in there. Okay, you so that's it. just for the position. That's not for the person yet. No, it is for the person. For the person? person. Okay. So you're, we're actually voting both things. We, did, we didn't have a contract before, right? No, right. So this, this is been handled by volunteers for years. Yes, and this so. is going to be voting so. for a contract. For the contract, uh, right? Put his name in it. Okay. So we will put his name in it. And this is the seven cemeteries besides. This is all eight cemeteries. Yes. So, Eric, do we need a motion <coughs> to appoint him as sexton first, and then the agent to convey real estate, or is that all part of the same? Correct. Thing? If you're appointing him and uh, approving the contract. And I will get his name. We will uh, add his name in here for this contract. I did not have that. Much so, okay, tell me what we're doing again. So, we have a motion to appoint him, him as, first. Yes. And as then, as the, and then the contract. The yeah. No. Nope. First, approve Do, the contract. Approve the contract first. Okay, and that's the the contract is just a general contract we're approving. Is that correct? It and is. then we're approving Chris to take the position. No. No. Nope. By approving the contract, his name was not in this contract. Okay. So that was an oversight. We will add his name in there as the person we're hiring in that contract. All right. And those that pay it in there is reflected of the, the agreement we had with Chris. That he okay, so we don't then have to do appoint Chris Young as a the cemetery person. By approving person. the contract, you're appointing as a contract. Okay. The All right. Good. All right. Sorry. Do I hear a motion? I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the contract for Chris Young as Sexton and also to authorize Eric Dodge to sign the contract. I'll second. I have, I have a motion and a second. Um, any discussion? Yes, the date is in there, right? July 1st to June 30th of 23? That's correct. That's so it's a one year. year. One year, yeah, okay. And um, do we have a like an estimated amount of time that he would spend a month <coughs> or that is um, is expected of him or it just depends on what the... Um, the the, the job itself is, is um, his need is out of his control. Yeah. So, um, there are times when he is the most busiest would be the springtime. Right. Um, typically folks pass away during the winter months. Um, they have their services once the ground thaws. Yeah. So in the spring of the year, through the first, you know, the beginning of June, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, services are held, and he's yeah. there for the opening and closing of everything, even the, mm -hmm. the cremate ceremony, mm -hmm. as small as that may seem. Mm -hmm. But it is uh, the insurance of that is that the remains are put in the proper spot, and for <laughs> the headstones of monument companies, that the pieces are poured in the proper lot. Uh, this has been some of the issue over the decades that we've been trying to resolve uh, with deep research and so on and so forth. And the town clerk's office has done a tremendous amount of work on this to make corrections. Uh, it's been exhausting. Software has been purchased to try and help us in the future to keep this straight. 
and the section is going to be expected to start uh, afresh moving forward with operations. <coughs> we are still going to seek out uh, a person to do the historical confirmation of the data that we have in the system currently. There are, I will tell you, in our cemeteries, and we are no different than any other municipality, there are areas where you might need to sell the grave only to find that there are bodies buried there and that were never marked. So uh, we have a cemetery with uh, down south on 100 in the Cochrane Road intersection. The entire back end of that cemetery is a pauper's pauper grave. There are multiple bar bodies buried there, no markings and no records historically of who's there. So we don't sell any lots there. <laughs> There are a lot of the little anomalies around the cemeteries. Uh, many of the cemeteries were sold uh, by families, had this section, that section, and so on. Um, but there are singular grave sites that are available for sale in amongst all those. Uh, and I can tell you it's Dennis Smith and uh, the folks from the Pleasant View Cemetery, Joy Marshall and Lori Wayne, that work very, very hard in order to see that those are still made available. And that we can Fill those, our cemeteries are finite in the room. So we're trying to make use of every inch and kind of keep it <coughs> documented. Very difficult task that the cemetery associations have, and many people just don't recognize. Um, they work with decades old data that sometimes was uh, well before the age of computers. Very difficult sometimes to discern the names and the plot numbers. So it's quite a chore. It's more work than you would imagine. <laughs> it's more work than I imagine. I spent the bulk of my morning playing sexton today. How does, since we no longer have a funeral home in town, how does the sexton, how does that all work? But I don't really, if it's detailed, we probably don't need to go into it tonight. Education process on our part. This starts tonight. Now that we have, we'll have a sexton in place. We'll do a, a moderated campaign to the uh, Association of Funeral Directors here in the state to get the word out about our cemeteries, the contact numbers, um, okay. the rules and regulations that we are going to abide by. And, and it's just uh, the associations both have uh, web pages, and it's, it's not a website you typically are scanning for, <laughs> but the information is there with their rules and policies and uh, for plannings and for many, uh, many other things. But uh, we just got to educate folks on who to call. If there's ever a question, really, you should just call your town offices. I can tell you that my town clerk's office is very well educated. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't want to say that. Uh, they will put you in touch with the sexton. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask Sarah, have you met him? Yes. And I, I, because um, he's going to be working with you a lot. Right? Yeah, yeah, Eric and um, Joy and Dennis invited me, and when they met with him, good. Yeah. good. I'm, I'm wondering if we should move. An agenda. Can I do it? Move an agenda item? We have a motion. Have right oh, I'm sorry. Did we didn't vote on that motion no. yet? We did not. No. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion has passed. Um, I'm just wondering. I think number seven on our agenda is going to get a little more in, a little more. Um, yeah. Oh, no, I, 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 I asked you earlier on if you would please to, to go ahead and vote on making our uh, move to have him. Uh, assigned as the agent to convey real estate in our eight cemeteries. No, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm just talking, oh. You're talking about, I'm we're still talking about Chris Young. We are? Yeah, we have another motion on we're Chris CSB. Young. Okay. You're not, you're not privy to this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I so, was, but I got confused with a few things. All right. So, so I'll make a motion to appoint Chris you. Young as the agent to convey real estate for the Morristown cemeteries. Oh, there are two different oh, things. Then. Okay. There's two associations, both of you in Morristown. Cemetery Association. Okay. So we just need to specify all eight cemeteries, please. For all motion. eight Morristown cemeteries. Thank you. Second. So I have a Thank motion and a second. Do I have any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, good. Um, we have, I'm going to, I wonder if we can move two agenda items up before number seven. I'd like to go with uh, number eight, which is continue the. Um, Police sign on bonus. Oh, excuse me, Tony. And what happens to the community concerns? Those guys oh, it's it's it's, it's at the end of the uh, at the end of the agenda. At the end now? Yeah. yeah. 
So you want me to sit here all night? And we would love you to sit here all night. We would love to have you. <laughs> Did you bring a snack? No. <laughs> no, bring no a supper. I'm sorry. Jason, well, I'll be back. Okay. Jason, would you explain to the board the mechanics of the sign-on bonus? Sure. Last year, we uh, initiated a $75 sign-on bonus for level three certified police officers. And what that means is that we can hire an, uh, an officer who's already certified and doesn't have to go through the four-month police academy. And all they have to do is their in-house field training, and which is about six weeks long. And then they're up and running on their own. Um, $75 sign-on bonus, it costs around about $20,000 to put somebody at level one pay scale through the police academy for four months, so uh, we're still ahead of the game. And we have hired in four certified police officers in last year. So I'd like to continue that since we do have two vacancies uh, in hopes of attracting a level three certified police officer. And continue that through? Um, through this fiscal year. This fiscal year. Which would end June third. June third. Twenty twenty three. Okay. Um, and is that in the budget? I was wondering, Tina, how does that affect the budget? Well, when we make the budget, we budget as if we're full staff. So if we're down two people, then we have, we have extra money in the budget that can support the seventy five hundred dollars sign on bonus. Okay. All right. Do I hear a motion? I'll make a motion that we uh, um, approve the sign-on bonus for new hires for until the end of the current fiscal fiscal year, till June 2023. Second. It's got a motion. I've uh, heard a motion and a second. Um, all the uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. The motion is passed. And number nine, we're going to go with uh, Andy Glover, the officer, the office patrol update. So Andy Glover last year, as I said earlier, uh, was he's our desk officer down there, been for 20 years, please. and uh, he has been during the time of uh, vacant slots, been helping us fill the patrol schedule of the police department. And last fall, in recognition of that, uh, there's certainly an increased risk. Uh, working road control, this is the administrative side of the house and the police department. So last year you authorized uh, him to uh, be paid at the same step level that he is currently on his administrative side, uh, which would be an increase in pay. Uh, so we're asking you to continue that practice uh, with Officer Glover specifically. It's okay. not a position that this is for him uh, because he's level two certified and then there's a long. Uh, and we'll have to continue that to the life of the current police contract, which is a three-year contract. Okay. So Andy's normally the desk officer, correct? Yes. And what you're looking for is a motion to increase his pay to the patrol pay when he's on that shift. Rather than use an increase in pay of number, we would simply say that he would be paid at the same step level on the patrol scale that he is on the administrative, the desk officer scale when he's working patrol. Tina, how does that work in our budget? Again, Andy would only be filling shifts when other people were gone or um, if we had a vacancy like our two vacancies. So it shouldn't be an issue um, that way because he's just helping out until we can become fully staffed. Okay, thank you. And it's a, it's a last resort. It's not something that we're looking to do a lot of, but you know, in the summer vacations and we are in short staffs. It helps during the weekdays. Do I hear a motion? I'll make a motion that Andy Glover be paid on step level as a patrol officer when he is on patrol. Does that sound correct? The equivalent step. The equivalent step. Until the end of the current police contract. Until the end of the current three-year police contract. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second. All those, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion is passed. Okay, we're ready to move on to number seven. Review Planning Council progress of paragraphs 207, Historic Preservation Zoning. Um, is Todd going to be speaking about this? I'm here, I thought I didn't make I'm sorry, oh, is Etienne? Can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, Etienne Hancock, I'm the current chair of the Planning Council. 
You want to come up front? I don't have anything to present. Say, okay. But uh, in your packet should be the uh, red lines for zoning for the section 207. Uh, so in response to, well, there's been a, a lot of development lately, particularly in the village, and a lot of teardowns of buildings and their uh, replacement of buildings that didn't look like they came from the 19th century, like ones that been torn down. And our response to that, so at this moment, is to propose um, an actual regulation that would sort of would dictate a minimum architectural standard for buildings that would replace torn down buildings within the village. And in particular on the streets noted, Maine, Portland, uh, Bridge, uh, at least up to Brooklyn, uh, we're proposing to add the lower section of Brooklyn. Uh, and then uh, Jersey Heights and Park Street. Um, yeah. And now, I, before, I'm sorry, I should have said this before you started. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but this is just for information. This isn't for us to vote on. We're just presenting information to, to us right. so we can see what the progress is going and what's happening. Right, so okay. part of this is just the process. Um, the Planning Council has landed on, on proposing this as a means to really respond to a lot of concern in town my own. I share it that when buildings are torn down and replaced, we'd like the buildings that come after to look substantially similar to the buildings they replaced, because we all like the 19th century architecture. It's on the planning council, I can't speak for you, but, um, and a lot of people are coming to our meetings these days uh, very concerned about the, what these new buildings look like versus the old that come before. And it's not just aesthetics, it's also size, it's placement with respect to the street, and all of those things have to be addressed as well. <coughs> so tonight, um, we don't want, we normally release a, a package of zoning changes every year annually. If you'd like to try to propose that for the fall, and it comes before you, there are more public hearings, and we don't want to propose a zoning bylaw that's kind of large <clears throat> and involved that you at that moment will have reservations with and say no to because it resets the clock basically another year for us. <clears throat> so tonight um, I asked and the council agreed that we should uh, get our draft before you to see what specific or general concerns you all might have, talk about that, bring back to the council. We have the same meeting scheduled for the village trustees. I think they're meeting on August 3rd, so we'll be in attendance as well. And the idea is there are only, uh, I think, two working meetings left for us um, to tweak what we have before we have to have a public, uh, one public hearing uh, that would proceed um, releasing it to you all, I believe, it's in November, the, the latest. Correct. So the idea would be that uh, once it's voted in uh, by the select board and the village trustees toward the end of the year, it would be in force at that time. So it would, uh, Todd, permit season starts? February, March, somewhere in there. It would be in force for the next building season. That's how much knows out there. So I, I'm, I can, if you've all read it and have questions ready, there, that's one way to do this, or I could just describe it. Um, I think if you just maybe if you describe it because a lot of people don't have it in front of them, I, is that okay with everyone else? Yeah, and I think um, or do you want yeah, to? I, I think description would be helpful. Yeah, for, just for me too. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. So there are two sections. Uh, one section is that um, when a building on the, the street facing, that's uh, what the state considers substantially contributing structure. Uh, so, for example, I think the Peggy Building. That is on that list. Um, the Water and Woods Building, I forgot what we call that now, Motors yeah. Building. Um, all these buildings that have the false fronts, the Morrisville of Years, okay. the Ornate Trim. The idea is that if one of those buildings were to be um, torn down, it would have to be replaced uh, substantially similar architecturally, at least for the first 30 feet of its depth from the street. So you, and, from 30 feet back, you could redevelop the lot uh, with much less restriction. 
And that sort of speaks to a trend we see in infill development in village centers and cities as well, where we're, we're trying to pay homage to the existing architecture and the, what people expect to see when they drive down the street of a small town. But we're try, also trying to provide a lot of flexibility to fill in the back of the lot. And that could be as much as another story. Um, substantially reduced architectural trim requirements, for example. Um, <clears throat> We basically just want the street facing to look pretty much like it looks now. And then to go back, how many feet did you say go back? So the, that requirement would, we're proposing that it goes back about 30 feet mm -hmm. within the lot depth. So then beyond that, you could add a story uh, per whatever height restriction uh, applies in that, in that particular zone. Uh, and not have to follow the exacting requirements of the architecture of that building. Um, the, the water woods building is, is very nice. It has nice uh, detailing around the windows, uh, nice corners. You wouldn't have to necessarily uh, replicate that through the entire building, just the first 30 feet. So that would be in a replacement scenario. Redevelopment would be similar. <clears throat> so that's one half of it. And then the other half is uh, buildings that uh, just in general are built in this region in this uh, district uh, um, on those given streets that were not substantially contributing uh, as per the, the state historic. The, there's a there's a full report, and I'm, oh, I'm forgetting the exact uh, title of that report, but. It's the report of the Morris Historic District. Right, it, it basically uh, has a photograph of every single building essentially in the village uh, within the district uh, so that we can determine it's whether it's, they consider it historically contributing or not. So the scenario is that when a new building goes up, um, uh, it would be forced, uh, basically the, the first, the first big one is um, no more vinyl. Mm -hmm. uh, we would want not wood siding, but something that looks like wood. Uh, there's lots of composite options these days. It gives a nice uh, solid feel and look as compared to uh, the buildings that it replaces, uh, the, the features that, that it replaces. Uh, corner boards, so basically the corners of the buildings have boards as opposed to the skinny um, form vinyl corners. <clears throat> 19th century buildings all have at least six or eight inch wide trim boards. Sometimes they're built up with an ornate stock. We're not requiring that, we just want a trim board. And the trim board should basically frame the building around the front and the sides. It's almost, it's hard to see a building that's from the 19th century in this town that doesn't have that, those features. So we'd like to essentially require them as a minimum standard. <clears throat> uh, just trim around windows. Uh, frame in the windows with wood look trim, minimum of four inch width. And uh, <clears throat> it looks has to, again, we're not requiring wood. Mm -hmm. I keep saying wood, I don't want to anybody to think we're requiring wood in the 21st century. What we'd like to require is something that looks like wood. A lot of historic buildings these days being constructed in this way are using the form PVC products because they, they have a lot of nice options now uh, to replicate historic features and they're, they're, they're a full form plastic. It's, P, it's called cellular PVC. That's one option and there's the fiber cement options um, and the like. Uh, windows should be regularly spaced. Uh, 19th century windows are all pretty much twice as tall as they are wide. Each sash is roughly square. Some buildings like the uh, power plate building have even taller windows. Those are rare. Um, but around the 60s, windows got wide and short. And that's not, we'd like to avoid that look continuing within this village domain in these buildings. And again, we're not regulating single family homes, we're not regulating duplexes, uh, we're regulating the central business zone, which is essentially, at this point, large uh, commercial buildings. Do you want, can I ask a question? Should I wait to, your, to the end? So I was, I was just curious about the window size. I'm wondering if they, um, the, do they add a lot more cost to the building? Um, I, I don't know if they add a lot more cost. Um, 
everything that I have said today will add some cost mm -hmm. to the building. Right. Uh, as a course, proportion of the total building cost, I suspect that it's rather small and it's mostly dominated by labor at this point. Okay. But that is one uh, item that we're trying to to come up with a, a reasonable estimate of today, in fact, well, I don't know today, but before we complete the zoning package so that we do have that at the ready. I didn't know if the windows had to be custom or not. No, no. Uh, oh, okay. Well, a lot of windows are custom, but window manufacturers generally have a huge range of size options. Oh, okay. All right. They have to meet egress requirements, particularly for second and third story. Right. Uh, and that's generally <clears throat> forces a minimum width. And so if we're, if we're forcing a proportion, the window might be a little bit, will be a little bit taller than the minimum required to meet egress requirements. And so that will add cost. Yes. I have two questions. Are you, um, one is um, you were saying this is um, particularly to pertain to large commercial buildings. Does that also include multi family units or? Yep. yep. Okay. And it's then the only thing it doesn't pertain to would be single family. Single homes, families. Okay. But you won't see that in right. on these streets, generally speaking. Right. And then um, um, will setbacks requirements change or stay the same? Uh, at the moment, they are staying the same. Mm -hmm. um, that has been a point of contention mm -hmm. with, or with uh, Bridge Street, yeah. and um, it certainly can be revisited. Mm -hmm. It is in this section 207, but at least uh, I myself separated from at least what the building looks like mm -hmm. versus where it's placed. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would hope that we could separate those two items. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you said, Gosh, I like the way I like the way you're proposing about the way buildings look, but there was strong dissent and the, the front setbacks needed to be changed. That would be the message we would go we would take back mm -hmm. to the council. Mm -hmm. You would like that information tonight, you're saying? I would like feedback. Yeah. Okay. Because what I All right. what I don't want is to come is for us to release mm -hmm. a, a package of zoning changes and then have it voted down in, right. in November. Right. Because that'll set us back an entire year. Right. Is a reminder for the select board, the planning council has no approval authority. The, the, the ticket, you guys punch the ticket, the buck stops with you all, the trustees. So they only tee up zoning changes, you approve them or not. So this is going to be your policy to approve or not. So mm -hmm. don't give feedback. Are we on the right track? Are they floating a lead balloon? Uh, what are you concerned about? What are you not concerned about? Do you love it? Do you not love it? We have a couple of things left to tweak it if need be. But this is something that's 85% there. <coughs> We're looking at feedback before we run across the finish line. And that feedback, obviously, is going to impact how you vote on it. It's really important to us right now. One other key piece would be enforcement. Um, Paul Trudell has generously offered to make um, little drawings of all mm -hmm. these specs. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that uh, if something is coming to Todd for a permit, he can look at the architectural print and then basically say, the corner board, yes, it's as wide as it's supposed to be, it's a freeze board. The windows are portioned correctly and give it a passing grade. And he then has the ability to check it on site if so, if there was a requirement to do so. The same goes for the DRV. Um, I will say Paul was pretty enthusiastic about this and thought it was easily uh, enforceable at that stage. It does require the production of much more, of more detailed plans, however, by, the, uh, by whoever is proposing. Did you have anything else you wanted to share with us from this? Uh, nothing in particular. Um, so I can either sit down or you can digest this for another meeting. And uh, I'm just not here. I'm just, I'm presenting this, but I, I don't know what response I should expect from this board. Anyway. My understanding is, is that our, our job here is to say we're pleased to see something plans moving forward or we're not yes basically yeah that would be a first yeah a first i can and Judy, i'll add to that any constructive feedback yes. we have for us is hugely helpful when we have these conversations so yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering and i'm not and i hope i'm not putting my foot in my mouth but given that we just seen we've just seen this tonight 
of taking another look at it too to give us a little more time. I, if I can just throw in two cents, I think that's prudent, Judy, and I think there are others that would probably want to email you information of their views over the next couple of weeks. We can bring this back to the next meeting um, and, and bring it back up, and that way more information can be available to you uh, in, in that way. And again, the meeting coming back in two weeks would not be a decision-making meeting. It would simply be another chance for you to provide some guidance to the planning council as they move forward toward a finished product if that's the direction you want to go. I'm I'm per I'm just personally delighted that that the planning council is moving on, looking at uh, making changes and making sure our architect is being um, it, the aesthetics are being addressed. And I think that's been a bone of contention that, that I <clears throat> keep reading in front porch forum and and I understand that. So I'm really pleased personally that planning council is doing this. Yeah, Don, did you? Have yeah, I. Yes. I actually had a bunch of notes here. I was going to share under select board concerns, so I'll <laughs> say it now. And I, I didn't know you were coming in, Etienne, and I'm very glad to, to see you're here. I have. Um, I've been. This is perhaps the biggest issue that I've listened to since coming on the board. Just what's happening in the village, the development that's going on, and you know, I've been stopped on the street. I've gotten emails, phone calls, and certainly read everything on Front Porch Forum. And um, clearly, there's a lot of people in this town that are concerned about what's going on right now. They're concerned about the look of the village. They're concerned about the new development that's going in. And I'm not going to get into the need for housing. I'm just going to quickly say I'm, I'm certainly on record here on the select board as saying that there is a very strong need for housing. I think most people in town agree that there's a very strong need for housing, but the concern is about what that housing, what kind of housing that is and what it looks like. So I, for one, am um, very pleased at what you're, you're bringing here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so from a general standpoint in this context, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I like this. I'm sure that the details will probably change and evolve over the next couple of months. Um, but I, 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 I do want to say, the people that have talked to me, this is what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of conversation that they want to have. So thank you. Jess, thank you. I, I, would, um, I would echo that. Um, I'm really pleased to see that you're taking the initiative on this and, again, um, looking to preserve the um, <coughs> historical um, aesthetics of the town. and. Um, I, I also would be interested to see um, some discussion around the setback requirements separately, um, if, that, if that's something that you, um, the Planning Council would consider. Um, I, I do, I feel that, um, again, I, I can't stress enough in, um, that I, I am a believer of high density um, infill housing in our downtowns as a way to prevent sprawl and a way to you know, create vital um, communities, but um, I do um, want to make sure that our town remains human scale. And I, I feel that the, um, the, the lack of setbacks um, on some of the new buildings um, does encroach on the feeling of a human scale that feels more like a city. Um, and um, I lived, you know, lived in a city. I feel that, that um, you lose your vistas, you, you lose your sight lines, um, and, you, and you feel smaller. Um, so if that's something that the planning council could also look at. Um, and then a really tiny thing um, I noticed on 2, 207.2, um, it says expect instead of accept, I believe. Oh, and I, I'm sure we all circled that. Yeah. Uh, Brian, did you have anything you want to add? Well, I want a question. There's a map here. Is that the map or is that proposed map? Uh, I believe it says proposed on Brooklyn Street. <coughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, I forgot which draft. What's in enforced now? Jersey Heights, Todd, is that enforced now? Partially, yeah. yes. Partially. So Jersey Partially. Heights is part of that? Yeah, the map is Brooklyn Street. Street. The maps are proposed on Lower Brooklyn Street, uh, Bridge Street between uh, Portland and uh, Brooklyn only, uh, Pleasant and Lower Main, Upper Main, only to uh, the War Memorial on Upper Main, and then uh, Jersey Heights. Okay. I didn't have Park Street on. We can talk about that later. I just have one other item that I think is a key detail. We're trying to do something that we haven't found any precedent for, and that's to not have an, another board full of volunteer people 
basically rendering an opinion on the plans that a developer submits. We're, we're absolutely trying to avoid that. We've just had a discussion about how it can be quite difficult to get people to sit on these boards, not the planning council, it's all volunteer. And so for that reason, it's important that you voice any concerns you have about this policy because it's it has to be strictly enforced. And it has to be enforceable by the, the zoning uh, administration, both between TOG, the permits, and the DRB. And that said, there will be some things that we have to change probably next year as, as this starts to come into swing and there'll be some hiccups, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But I did want to make that clear. We're trying to do something that is has not been done by the surrounding towns that we've found. And have you found, um, when you talk to surrounding towns, they do have like a, a, a second board and I'm, it's slipping my mind what it might be called. Historic, the, historic, historic preservation, preservation or whatever. Do you find that what happens when they have when you have a board like that, another extra entity involved? Well, when I've read the zoning bylaws for Montpelier and Stowe, uh, they're pretty thin. They're very general. They don't specify. They don't specify these things. What they specify is that you present your plans to them, so they can render an opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, the expert in the room could offer his, his his opinion of how that process works as well. At the moment, I mean, we're seeking feedback. So, the planning council did not want to go down that road with this regulation because it, again, it adds overhead to the process, which arguably probably costs the developer more in legal fees and times and plans that have to be changed than uh, than the cost of these changes to the actual physical envelope. That we're proposing. Corner boards, solid sun, uh, siding, or both siding, not just, we just don't want form final. And properly proportioned windows don't necessarily add up to uh, what it costs to pay a lawyer to stand up an engineer to sit in a, another <coughs> review meeting with yet another board on the way to trying to get a permit. And then architectural changes based on the opinion of those five people at that moment. And uh, that's what's unique in particular <clears throat> and worthy of strong consideration. All right. Is this an appropriate time to ask Todd if, um, if this feels like to you um, requirements that are specific enough that if brought, you know, if, if this was your new list of requirements, it would be um, easy to um, apply them to, to Permits. The sketch would be very helpful. Right, okay. I mean, this, for the woman general, when you write a zoning bylaw, I mean, I love keeping it simple enough that uh, Joe or Sally, homeowner, can understand it, the zoning administrator can understand it, the developer can understand it. We're all on the same playing field. So uh, most of this language is pretty understandable. This is the language in here that's a little higher brow and may need some explanation. Uh, but I think really the illustrative details, if Paul will so generously donate them, will really make everyone's life a lot simpler. So if we get those, I think this is uh, this will be workable. I think going forward too, that we, as we keep having these meetings, try to get the word out to anybody that's interested in being here and hearing it and putting their input in, because their input probably is more important than mine. Is the input, input is also being taken at the planning commission meetings, is that correct, Todd? Correct. So those are the, that's where the the rubber hits, hits the road there. We approve them when they come to us, but the decisions are being made at the planning commission. Mm -hmm. And that's where people should be going and, and talking to the planning commission about these, these this subject. Yeah. And it's, it's significant regulation. This is probably the most, uh, uh, the most regulation planning council proposed in a specific area, maybe ever. So it's really significant what you're seeing here in these three or four pages. So. It's something we need to look at seriously, obviously, and want to make sure the point of this means to make sure you think we're on the right track and not lost in the woods before we go down and try to take this across the finish line, only be set back by the year. Judy. Yes. Sharon has something to say. I'm sorry, but I'll bring this up to any other discussion. I don't know. Um, I, I, well, <laughs> but, I have just a simple question. Will you, as a select board, have an interest in? 
I heard you just say that we should air our our ideas, mm -hmm. concerns with NTN and his planning council. There have been many of us there the last two times. While our people are way late in getting involved, we are being told that there won't be another time for us to be heard until the first born public hearing. So I'm asking, is there a possibility that that could be changed in any way? I don't have an answer. I'd have to defer back to how the, the process, and I don't know the, how the process works. I don't know if Eric or um, Todd could answer that. We're proposing public hearings, uh, probably advertising in September. Uh, the board really has two, we said two working meetings to finalize this language. Um, we've got a lot of input from the public so far. I think we, oh. we need to take it across the finish line. The opportunities for more public input. Are we, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe we're talking about two separate concerns. Like, like, um, cause <clears throat> Todd, I think you're talking about this particular zoning change. Mm -hmm. And I believe you're speaking about the new proposed um, zoning changes in Brooklyn Heights. Am I correct? Talking about it all. Okay. Mm -hmm. And also, well, I'm also wondering if this is something, if we can move through these agenda items and then bring all this up during community concerns. I don't, I don't know. Well, my question really pertains to particularly historical society. And when I get a chance, I'd like to speak about that. Okay. I, we, we should wait till community concerns, right? I, I or would just, I would just remind you that yeah. the planning council is developing this bylaw. Right. We are looking for the board to either say, continue, we, we like what's mm -hmm. there so far, please continue in that effort, mm -hmm. or no, this is off the mark, don't waste any more time on it. Discussions <laughs> about content of that bylaw are best suited to happen at the planning council meetings when there's an agenda item opens that discussion. They have two more working meetings, you said. Correct. Where they're going to be working on this bylaw, and that would be a perfect time for community input to happen. And then the planning council can decide amongst themselves the best move forward, the best step forward. What they bring to you to vote on will be a finished product as a result of a public hearing where they're presenting you the bylaws followed by another hearing, which is where you will make your final decision on voting on the finals. So I, I don't think we're, I think we're spinning our wheels to continue to talk about the content of this zoning bylaw proposal in the select board meeting, because no decision is going to be made on any of them. Uh, I think that the information you presented at the planning council meetings, I think that's the appropriate place for it, because that's the group that's building this. Yes, but those meetings aren't recorded, and I don't feel comfortable going to meetings that there's no um, nobody held accountable. There's no way to hold anybody accountable because nothing's recorded and nothing's taped. Well, we have meeting minutes now. That's different. Every every meeting in town is now going to Zoom or it's recorded. So I learned last week at their meeting that any historical building can be torn down. That's meaning the old schoolhouse, the Grange Hall, which is now River of Arts and I think that's a big concern to us citizens that we could lose any, uh, but can come in and, and tear that down and the whole history is gone. So from the first schoolhouse to where it is now. I was, I was at that meeting, I heard the discussion and um, I also went on the VLTC website to see about some of this information. And if it's a, uh, I think a state historical building, it has to go through the state if you want to demolish something, there's procedures to go. And I think Todd also mentioned that he had brought this up to the planning commission. They chose not to, to deal with it for, for whatever reason. They chose section 207 instead. They chose a different section. At this point, nobody in town, as far as I know, and I don't know about Todd, uh, is planning on tearing down any historical buildings. Sir? Height requirements beyond 30 feet, or are we going to be walking around with six-story walk-ups? We're not going. We're not going to go there tonight. We're not going to go there. Sorry, but the, it's that's all, how I can answer your question. Is that there, there isn't anything on the planning? Anybody tearing down any historical buildings? 
Not yet, but there's nothing in place that says that our few historical. That's right. Historical and the select the, the select board doesn't make that decision. The planning council, the zoning people, are the ones who decide what is going to be on um, on their well, agenda. I think the town or somebody needs to rethink on how those meetings are being held. Um, you can't hear people speaking. There's no. If you're sitting in the back, you can't hear anything. No attendance. There's no attendance. There's no paperwork to even look at the whole meeting. And you have them down here in the winter. Why can't we have them down here in the summer when we when they're where they're recorded? These are very good questions. I don't have any answers for you. Well, I think the the board really needs to take that into consideration. So I want to, uh, let's finish this okay. topic that we're doing. Um, so we don't have to vote on anything, just we're giving our feedback to Etienne and the Planning Commission, and we're going to look at this in another, um, in two more weeks. Okay. But, is that, is that but I think what, I, what you're hearing from the board is a resounding, we're really pleased with the direction that this is going. Okay. Well, good. Um, it is where we started, and if... Um, like the demolition uh, question came up and what we talked about was a demo delay. It's sometimes employed to try to slow down these kinds of decisions. And we decided that that was not appropriate because <coughs> it just arbitrarily adds costs to the process that is more than likely to happen anyway. When again, that cost could be applied to making a better building rather than spending on lawyers. If, if, there was a feeling of a, of a pending emergency, for example. Um, I, I don't think the planning council is necessarily the appropriate body to say it's too much and we need to stop the demolition of, histor of what we consider historic buildings. Often historic buildings have a lot of need, are in very poor shape, which is why they're being demoed. I don't, I don't feel comfortable that the planning council wants to take that on. I think that's much more of a legal body issue at the time, responding to community concerns and complaints. And um, if you were to direct the planning council, if you wanted to see something like that, we would, of course, research ways to do it. It just would be rather slow. And um, anyway. Are you saying that the process would be slow? <clears throat> or? To find the right kind of response to the concern about historic buildings being demolished where the action is to stop the demolish stop the building from being demolished rather than to control what replaces it which is really the tactic that we've taken i don't think the planning council is really wants to take on that kind of a role again we're advisory to council and we can present rules to you and the village trustees but we don't we don't really arbitrate them. We don't enforce them. You do. Okay. So, again, if you consider this a public emergency in response to public outcry, mm -hmm. I would expect some sort of direction directly from the select board. We might craft something. We might debate it and bring it back to you. But again, the planning council has avoided any kind of demolition restriction uh, to date. What's, what's some of the demos that are happening in the next three months? I have no idea. Okay, fair enough. I know there was a property demo next near my, next to my home. Oh, they just demoed. Seems like they all. I called. All of a sudden, you come in town and no, I called Todd to see if it was appropriate, and it was. So, <laughs> I didn't have any leg to stand on. But um, I followed up the process with who's in charge of who would know how that works, and I called him directly to find out. Thank you. Thank you, Tan. Thank you. Um, so, next on our agenda, old business. No old business. Approved warrants. We hear a motion. No motion. Second. 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 And a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Town administrator's report. Uh, yes. Last couple weeks, I met with the Halfway Hospital and members of the Halfway Hospital administration to discuss highway infrastructure as they are planning for their future expansions, having bought the previous property across from the National Road Army and that title here. So they have plans to 
keepers of plants. Wait, who? Oh, I thought, sorry. Concord oh. Hospital. Oh, gotcha. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so they just wanted to touch base with us about those policies and we'll see in the future. And, uh, that, that's pretty much what it was. We just we just opened conversation about what their plans are for construction down the road and where we might be on road policies in particular about taking in the roads uh, that would be in that road. Uh, I have met with uh, a meeting with department heads and staff that I directly supervise for our year review uh, overlook and the goal setting for the upcoming year. It's going very, very well. Uh, great open communications. So, uh, I get good feedback and uh, look forward to the rest of those. And uh, the renovations have begun to the second floor office space. You can see the holes in the back of our building. The good news is uh, the construction of this building is uh, two brick layers thick, very, very sturdy building. Form of the Mason I spoke to this morning he says this thing is strong and strong can be. The bad news is this building is built very, very strong <laughs> and it is taking a lot of time to cut through eight inches of uh, brick and get them ready for the window placements upstairs. That was that was very interesting. We hear how it is inside the building. <laughs> but anyway, that goes that goes with the territory. We'll get each other next time. That's it. Nope. My apologies. <laughs> One of the largest changes that I forgot about on this list. Paula P, formerly the assistant finance director and assistant HR director, has now been promoted to HR director. And Tina will now drop that portion of her title back to strictly finance director. Uh, Paula has many years of experience in human resources development, having come from that work to when she came here four years ago. Uh, she's very, very excited, has been working in that line for, as I've explained in prior meetings, uh, dealing with employee issues and benefit questions. This has been online for a long time. We've been working toward this for a year and uh, very, very pleased to have her in that position. And you won't see a lot of change in function currently until we're able to backfill her assistant finance director position, for which time she will give up accounts payable, which she would be very happy to do, I think. Uh, but yeah, so there's, so there's a couple of months still before we're able to probably fill back reasonably with uh, advertising uh, internal first and then external and then if, if need be. Uh, but yeah, going forward, that's so we're pretty excited about that change. So when did congratulations? Congratulations. When did when was your official start date? Today or yesterday? Yesterday. Today is the beginning of the paper, so officially yesterday. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Even though you've been here. <laughs> Thank you. Is that the end of your report? Janice, I can Thank you. Select board concern. We'll start with Don. Well, I had my big concern. I, I will say um, I got a couple of meetings coming up. I'm meeting with Tina Friday morning. I'm going to get my financing 101 done. And I'm also meeting with, uh, I did at the last meeting say I was going to meet with Ryan Harity. Tom, I'm looking at you. Um, and I, I do have a meeting this Thursday to talk to him about in particular, the whole issue of uh, development in town and its impact on the schools. So and he was very happy to set that meeting up with me. Doing that I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll ask him. Thank you. So, great. Well, I had just a little information on that. Sure. I recognize that I saw in the minutes from a couple weeks ago that was part of the discussion. I did a survey of the towns that we had, uh, 251, 17 year children. So it's a lot less than what I thought it was. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? 17 out of 251. But what about coming forward? <laughs> That's the information that I have. I would say that most of the applications are. Do not have children applying, or there's, you know, there's not children in the units for most of the applicants. That, <coughs> that would be about 
six percent. This is up all the units that we manage yeah. okay. in time. Uh, okay. So it's it's not a lot of children coming to town. A lot of young adults, but not a lot of Just for clarity, my question is going to be about capacity. Right. So, right. No, I just wanted to talk about it. Sorry, you, you guys. Thank you. Thanks. School every year. Your consultant. Their school is still projecting declining enrollment or stable enrollment for this community. They looked at all the development stuff. They looked at all the current history. They're still saying with the, uh, what they're seeing in Northern New England, they're expecting school problems. <laughs> Funding is primarily based upon how many pupils you have. So there's a, a demand on our future to fire on school board issues. But the more people, the more money, the more money you get from from the state. So there's a you know, minimum, and obviously within that extra usually helps. So those are my concerns. I'll go next. Um, so I uh, received several emails over the last um, couple weeks. Um, I unfortunately haven't gotten back to everyone, so I apologize if you're in the room and I didn't get back to you. Um, because there are a lot of questions that I don't know the answers to. Um, but one question, I think it's been brought up a few times tonight, and we've definitely floated it before, um, is whether or not we can um, um, put our planning council uh, meetings on Zoom. Um, if that can happen just up at, at the um, country club. Um, I do think um, the, the, the concern, I understand the concern from um, participants that um, they, would like to, they would like to be able to tune in from home or <coughs> also have a record. Um, but I also think um, from the town's perspective, it would behoove us to have um, that kind of a record. Um, two things that would need to help make that happen are uh -huh. the Zoom setup in this meeting room with the U-shaped table and the chairs, you have to see in this meeting room. This meeting room is too small for planning council meetings. You cannot do a planning council meeting in this room. In the last two meetings alone, we've had an average 50 people. You can't, you can't do it. So so is this room do, smaller do, than the country club? When they do a tent. tent. We're under the tent. Oh, so the tent. Oh, yeah, gosh. I mean, if you rework the room so the table is flat again and yeah. you ceiling mounted the equipment and brought the chairs back, it's yeah. more feasible. Mm -hmm. I also need help staff wise. Right. I mean, Eric's got a duty to help with the meeting of minutes. I mean, right. I'm doing as much as I can to right. try to run the meeting. I can't do it all. Right. I can't do the Zoom. I can't do the minutes. Right. I can't. Right. I, can't. Right. I would need staff help. <clears throat> okay. If you want to allocate staff help, sure. Until then, I really just can't do it. Right. Okay. Right. okay. Also, the, they're doing the country club during the summer with COVID issues, and the tent obviously isn't wired for sound or internet or anything like that. Right. Okay. Uh, I thought maybe, did you mention that you thought it was illegal for us to take that or have that lot of the country club? <laughs> no, I don't think yeah, the select yeah, board, yeah, yeah, I don't think the select board yeah. meetings are Zoomed legally because they're not recording the public comments on the, uh, on the chat, unless you're keeping a physical copy of them somewhere, <clears throat> unless you can say what, uh, Joe, Joe Smith said in the chat, in six months going to pull out a public record request, I think you're violating the meeting law. I think you're doing it tonight. So, so is this illegal what we're doing today? In my opinion, yes. I don't know if that's the case. But yeah. we'll talk that's my opinion. Later. If you can produce the well, public chats with message chats, if you turn the public chat off on Zoom, I think you're covered. But if you have the public chat on and people are asking questions on there, if you can't produce that document six months later, I think you want to file the open. Well, these are these are all recorded, correct? Yeah, but the public chat isn't. I mean, if they're doing if they're doing the, this yes. type, of, I don't know. No. Well, <clears throat> yeah, that's something. I think maybe that's something we should revisit and put on a future agenda because um, I do hear that from a ton of people who um, I represent, who I know voted for me, and so I'd like to. Um, to explore that a little more. Um, I can't remember. I should have um, just given you a call, Eric. Did we appoint, we appointed a tree warden, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, have they, um, have they um, done anything yet? Um, 
I should touch, I should just touch base with them. I had someone who was interested, someone else who was interested. You apply for a slack. Yeah, yeah. And um, okay, so I'll be in touch with them. Um, and then another concern I heard, um, and I know I'm 99.9% .9 sure that this is a, um, a B trans um, jurisdiction question, but um, some people were concerned about e bikes on the, um, on the rail trail and the speed of e bikes. Um, is that anything that we can, um, that we care to look at? Um, posting a sign saying, keep your speed down to 15 miles an hour? We can't, um, really we can't really on the, yeah, that's what I figured. Okay. We can't put our work on the bridge, we will be trying to finish. What's that? Um, we can't put our work on the bridge, on the bridge, without getting permission from B. Right, right. Because it's just gone right. through there. Right. <laughs> okay. Right. Those are my concerns. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Brian? I'm all set. You're all set. Um, my, I had a, uh, was attending a, a workshop today about housing and it was an interesting piece of information just throwing it out there 20 percent of the housing in Stowe is through airbnb i just thought that was very interesting it's very telling about what's going on and how housing is being pushed out of that community and into uh, other communities are having to um, take in other people who can't afford to live there so just as my soapbox moment. Um, so I've lost the agenda. Okay, community concerns. Do we have people who have community concerns? Would you raise your hand? Just two, three, just three, four, five, six? Okay, how about we do three minutes for everybody? Six, three times six is 18, we'll try that. Uh, Tony will go with you first. Please introduce yourself when you do your community concerns. Yes, I'm uh, Tony Cody from Cody Hill. Um, first of all, how come the community concerns relax? We changed it uh, maybe two months ago. Okay, because you're not getting no more people here. I guess if there was, if you had to wait as long as I did here to say what I had to say, more people would come, right? I figured you'd fall asleep by then. Yeah, <laughs> my steak is burnt. Well, we, oh, well no. it's something we decided we would try out, but but we're open to feedback about it. <laughs> right. So my concern tonight is Cody Hill. It's not getting fixed. There's potholes there, and I guess this is Kevin's deal. Maybe you can tell me what's going on. Okay, so address this. And I have I have an Airbnb, Thank you. and we have a lot of Airbnbs on Cody Hill, and there's a lot of out of staters up there. And they come down that hill, and they're in the middle of the hill. It's it's a concern. Now there's potholes all over, all over. Somehow they, they you sent two people up there. You sent some people up there two so, weeks ago, and they built two potholes. There's four more potholes up there. So what's going on? So let me ask Kevin. Kevin, can you help address that? We did go up to the major potholes. Now you go up there tomorrow morning and you see the potholes up there that, that are not filled. There's always, I mean, I can only do so much with what I've got. I mean, yeah. there's certain potholes that the depth isn't deep enough, we can't really fill them because it doesn't fit here. They have to be a minimum of about three inches deep. Believe so me, what do you do? Three inches deep. What, so what happens? What do you what, just leave it until it gets I can go in and dig it out, but we've got Much stuff all over the town that's doing the same thing. It's things that I've inherited along the way. I just know it's not getting done. And I know we've got a pretty good tax base up there. And I would appreciate it if it gets done. I'm not asking a lot. Um, my fault, I drive 30 year old cars, but I like to keep my cars intact. And the only other concern I have is the weed whacking on the side of the roads is terrible. Now, if people are worried about buildings being built, whoever's hacking up the sides of the roads on the Stagecoach Road and French Hill, looks terrible. It looks like a war zone, and it should stop. If you can't get out there with a chainsaw and chainsaw it and do it properly, there's no reason to have whatever they're using 
go up the sides of the roads, and if anybody wants to go up the stagecoach road right now and look at the stagecoach road on the right side, all the way up through there, stir. There's there's wildlife out there every morning. I, I take that road every morning, six o'clock in the morning. And I know there's wildlife out there getting hurt because there's jagged trees all the way up through there. And it should be fixed. It's never been like that before, but it's like that now. And I know Eric, you said they do a good job. It's been like that for six weeks. It's not getting done, that's all I know. Nothing is done. That's my opinion right now. Thank you, Tony. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Jamie? Uh, Would you like my community to, concern, uh, you, James Brewster. Thank you. Uh, my community concern uh, is the community concern section. Mm -hmm. um, I recommend, or I'd like to see it move back to the beginning of the meeting uh, with a five minute maximum time for each allotted speaker with an overall time frame of 30 minutes for community concerns and a sign-in sheet to regulate that first come, first serve. All right, take your consent there. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I don't, I didn't see everyone's hands or everyone's name. So if you raise your hand, uh, Kathy, can you Kathy, introduce you? Thank you. I just want, I really just want to express how important I feel that we get the zoning or planning back down here and where it's recorded. Um, I was a little appalled last week and there's no way to prove anything. Um, so, and I'm really concerned. I don't think we have, um, when I'm talking historic buildings, I'm not talking historical houses that people own personally, you know, I'm, and I'm not even sure who owns Noe's house, but what if something, there was no money to run that anymore. I mean, would somebody put out for the town to try to run it, or is it just going to be demolished and turned into apartments? And I'm really concerned about Rivers Arts because there's going to be building all around that, and Rivers Arts is going to be a huge eyesore for the entrance of the buildings back there. Well, I think um, I think we own. I think the town owns the noise building, right? Oh, so, right. So, 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 and, not saying, and the Copley but, Trust is um, funds it, correct? Yeah. No. Uh, no. 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 The town the town yeah. But you know, the, the Rivers Arts is uh, the first schoolhouse. It was moved there then to be the Grange Hall. Um, you know, and I just, it, that's a huge history to this town. It's not like it's just some stupid old store that they sold food out of. There's a lot of history in that building. And I hate, would hate to see that building be torn down for a parking lot. I, I don't think there's any plans for anybody to be tearing it down. So I hope that goes out from this meeting that there's no plans to well, tear down River Arts. Right? Oh, I don't think so. River Arts. Who owns it? River Arts. River Arts owns it. River Arts is not part of the town? No. no. Well, I know the historic building is, and uh, we put money into it, and it's in the budget. The, isn't there a section where we paid uh, half a cent or yeah. for the noise house the noise house currently the taxpayers have approved a half a cent for a construction project and so, so that's ours and we take care of it right but like like um, there's so but uh, uh, rivers arts is on its own what if it came up for sale what if uh, grand pink buys it and they sell to grand pink <laughs> There's, there's no, I'm not, I'm not making fun or anything. I'm just saying, I foresee that. And it's the, the first schoolhouse in this town. And it's in good shape. And it shouldn't just disappear someday. Well, my opinion is, if it's up for sale and somebody buys it, that's up to them. So if you want us to buy it, which is probably, <laughs> see if we can buy that. And don't say because I mean, if we own don't it, promise no. anything. No, no, but they go in front of the taxpayers. If taxpayers want to buy it, let them buy it. I mean, there's always a solution. Because you know, there's a lot of historic buildings around here. They're going to get sold. We don't. Somebody's selling them. Somebody's going to buy them. Shine a little bit. Sure. There's a process in Vermont that we're not speaking to right now. It's called Act 250. So change of use. If if I was to buy current River Arts building, mm -hmm. I have to go through 
a long list of criteria, one of which is historic, before I can ever do a thing with the building. And I think you'll find that that is probably mm. one of the most costly in the downtown area, where a lot mm. of our history is located. One of the most expensive parts of that to be permanent when you're going to change of use on a building like that. So Thank you. There, there are state processes in, yeah. involved yeah. for developers to follow that, that look out for that. And, and certainly local outcry can be a part of that voice. So uh, we're not reinventing the wheel uh, here as far as uh, our historic building <coughs> right here, oh, there, there are agencies out there that are watching for that. Thank you. Well, if that was responded to me last week when I asked the question, I probably wouldn't be here, but the response was any historical building can be torn down. So I guess we just like wasted everybody's time because if I would have got the proper response last Tuesday and not that every historical building can be torn down, I would have been here for two hours. Mm. Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. Thank you for your Was there someone else who had their hand up? Yes. Thank you. Um, I was just curious, was the procedure for changing the zoning in the town, and did the citizens vote on it ever? Oh, that's a good zoning, question. Zoning process. <laughs> like, uh, I'll have the, the, we're going to be doing, talking about this. I'm in the process of a project of mine to put something on our Facebook page. Excuse me, our, our home page, um, explaining some of the processes that are involved in, in town government, because there is a lot of questions about Zoning bylaws are generated as a result of the needs of the community. And the planning director and our zoning administrator, Tom Thomas, is the, the years for a lot of that. And uh, he, in this building, he hears a lot from the, the community about the needs. And in fact, this historic preservation piece, 207, was a direct result of public concern and outcry about their, their perceived loss of. Perceived loss of, am I done? <laughs> <laughs> Perceived loss of the historic nature of our downtown. So, uh, planning council, they deliberate over a year's time about proposed zoning changes that, that impact our community to keep it, uh, the development going in, in a certain direction, the, the will of the people, so to speak. Planning council is where ideas are born, they're discussed, and then there's a zoning bylaw proposal annually those proposals are brought in front of the select board the planning commission the planning council does not have the authority to approve zoning changes they propose zoning bylaw changes and the select board deliberates on that during open hearings on that in the fall of the year it sounds to me like it could be as late as november this year so there will be an open hearing where Todd will present the planning council's proposed zoning changes zoning bylaw changes there will be a follow-up hearing and in the in-between time is public comment during the hearings and then, you know, phone calls, emails, communications with board members in between time. And then the final hearing where the select board chooses which of the zoning bylaws that are being proposed to adopt. Once those are adopted, that is the set of rules by which the DRB, the Business of Owner Group Review Board, enforces our zoning bylaws during certain permitted construction. So the public comment that you were asking for would be either at the planning council meeting when they're developing these bylaw proposals or during the open hearings when they present them to the select board in the fall year. Or the and trustees. If, and if nobody shows up from the public to give their piece, speak what they want to, then it's just the five people on the board and on the select board? Correct. Okay. And the trustees. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. trustees, yeah, that's right. But do they take into consideration the impact that they have on ownership in that district? I think the planning council takes into consideration all of them. Well, if, people, if people are engaged in the process and they want to go to the county council meetings and offer up their opinion, there, the, the most of the agendas for planning council is meets the same criteria that we meet for all our own meetings. And they're, they're posted in excess of what the statute requires. Uh, we use social media uh, to get that word out. but. Public engagement is absolutely vital to municipal government to function. We need the input from the citizenry, but if folks don't see that, like the front porch forum, planning council agendas are there every time. I read it every time. And but if people aren't, if it doesn't excite them, you know, perhaps, then they don't become engaged. 
And when they do become engaged, oftentimes it's so far through the process that they feel like they're powerless. <coughs> The power is is earlier on in the process, mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's I encourage everybody really to become involved. Look at the agendas. If you have a question about the agendas, if it's planning or DRB, give Tom a call. He administers both those boards. And if you don't understand what it, what it is on the agenda item, but you think it may pertain to you, give him a call. Send him an email. Communicate with us. We, we're happy to talk to anybody about these things. So. Okay. Judy. Yeah. Oh, we have someone on, who's on, I don't, uh, okay. I wasn't finished. I was going to ask if it could be chartered into, the, I don't know if it's town rules or whatever, that it be voted on by the citizenry. Instead of, you know, it could be sent out for town meeting day or during general elections in November. I'm not sure how we would do that. Um, routinely, there are as many as, 10 to 20 zoning bylaw uh, proposal, proposed changes annually. Our ballots would become pages long, and I, I, I don't know how to do that. Would there be a way to concentrate on the ones that affect our town mostly? Like, depends on which yeah, aspect of what's going on all around us. I, I hear you. I, I'm, I'm saying there, there's a process in place currently, and it's the planning council meetings, the agendas, attending that, becoming involved there. Because there's a big difference between like a dog park. And a six story walk up over 136 unit going in right next to your house. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, understood. I understand what you're saying. So there is a way to prioritize things and let the community know. Can you advertise a meeting to go up to the gym up there, or can we use the gym now? Judy. Mm -hmm. That lady's been waiting. Yeah. We have, we're gonna, I'm going to have to like move on from this. I don't know that we're going to answer well, the call. Back right. Them, right. But I would give her <clears> the chance. She's been waiting for a while. Is that Trisha? That's Trisha. Trisha. Oh, it's Trisha. Hey, if, if I could just speak a little bit. And I heard them talking about the River Arts Building and about, um, you know, development of the River Arts Building. I'm chair of the board of River Arts Building. You know, we work very well with local developers and about what's happening between each side of River Arts and does it does it really coincide with what River Arts building is, you know, a historical building? I, I, I would have to say, I think more than anything, I think the, the community needs to come together and hear from Graham and Nick and the other developers that are what they are doing in town. I think transparency is the biggest thing that's good, gonna help our community. I mean, River River Arts is River Arts. It is going to be there forever. I will just tell you, they are strong. They are a great organization. But I think a lot of this that I hear from everyone about what's happening here and what's happening there, it's because we don't have enough transparency between everyone. And I think a lot of it is is just so everyone knows what's happening in our community. I mean, we've we've talked about it in the town. If you, if you tell people ahead of what's going to happen when we're going to close the street, people are all really good about it. But if you don't tell them about it, then they're like, "Why are you closing my street? Why are you doing this?" But and so I think part of the problem here, from what I'm hearing about development and everything, is let's just make sure that we're really all transparent from planning from. Uh, zoning and granted, it is not my bollywhack. It is not my job. It's not anything. But I also hear a lot as from the community development side, and I, I just would encourage everyone to be very, very open and transparent about what we are doing and why this is really good for our community. I mean, could I say a lot more about how I think development is great for our community? Yes, I could. But it's not my job. And I want to say thanks, Todd Thomas. You do a great job for our community. And uh, thanks, Select Board, for listening. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Tricia. Tricia. Is there someone else who had a community concern? Tom? Right. Right. Would you add oh. on this transparency? Most of the people found out about all this construction going on after it was put out. The transparency would help out by having the planning boards Zoom their meetings and let everybody know. 
when they meet each other. And that way, maybe we would get the people getting the information before it happens. And then they can have the input. And this isn't anything against what Graham or anything else. That the planning board, the review board, and you, the select board, agree to do all that stuff before half the town even knew it was going on. And you could end that, <coughs> help end that, by zooming those meetings. I was just like when that gentleman asked the gentleman that was speaking earlier tonight what was coming up. He says, I don't know. How can he not know? I mean, that's just like not answering a question. I, I don't understand that. Well, what was going to be the What's coming up for development when he asked the gentleman no. that was speaking earlier? If he's. I think you asked him what was being demolished. And he, no, not me. Another gentleman asked him what was coming up in the future for building. And tonight, he told oh. him he didn't know. The question was, Eddie Ann Hancock. Eddie Hancock is the chair of the planning council. Yeah. He's right there. He's got nothing to do with developing this community. I mean, you can speak for yourself. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Somebody else? It would not help transparency to have their meetings. So. To address your question, uh, yeah. I, I suppose, yes, it would. And the matter is one of mechanics. And, uh, yeah, I see. Yeah. <clears throat> and the other, uh, Etienne, um, are, are we talk Kathy, you're talking about Etienne answering yes. a question? Because they don't, they don't do development. They don't approve development. That goes through the DRB. So he wouldn't know necessarily okay, what's enough. going on. Yeah. Thank you. Was there another, someone else had another question? Had their hand up? Uh, Sarah? Can I put a plug in? Um, for budget time, because I do BCA meetings and I do abatement meetings, um, I'm leaving the planning commission to planning. <laughs> I'm neutral in that territory. But as clerk role, it'd be awesome to have an assistant to help me take minutes. Uh, it's really hard for me to do um, the minute taking, help lead all of the discussion play secretary, take all the minutes, do all the, I do Zoom all of my meetings um, and run them all hybrid. It's a lot for one person to try and manage that and take decent minutes and lead um, conversation. And I had a huge abatement meeting that you guys were out a lot a couple weeks ago. But, like we're running out of space, so just like when you're thinking about budgets, we're, we need, bigger space, we need a little more help. Isn't there software that you can use for taking minutes? Probably, but it takes money, it takes money. time learning. This room takes money. We have Sarah and I don't have a duty to help with our meetings. I mean, it's, it's a money issue. I so think we make Ed do it. Well, and I'm going to say, because I work in this room, we have so many amazing kids up there that would love an opportunity to be get involved. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can work on that. I mean, can we it, can't build can, our town this fast and, and not put a little money into these things. Now, maybe we need to hire one person to be the minute taker of all of them and come set up the main things. And we can't, we can't just do that like that, right, Tina? Well, no, it's not we have, it's, tomorrow. No, it would have to be done the during future. the budget time. Yeah, right. and that's what and that's what Sarah's talking about is having something going forward and looking at. Uh, we're going through the budget process in the fall. So adding, looking at adding somebody. Is it possible, um, is it legally possible to have a volunteer take minutes during meetings? Absolutely not. No. Either it has a contract to... employee or a full time employee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can't, a volunteer does not work. Okay. Can you identify yourself, please? I'm an exposure. I like to add the transparency thing and it's transparent, but it's profits over people and cash over community right now. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, I assume you're taking notes on this and well, this is I'll something we Luke, could you give your first and last name again, please? Luke Opperling. Thank you. Opper I say, Opperling. Eric, I'm sure you're taking notes on this. We, Eric, was I still this whole name? idea of the Thank planning you. council not taking minutes and not being Zoom is something we've heard a couple of times and it is something we probably should so, take up. I mean, neither is, so there I, are I, minutes. I'm sure we're getting the language right, folks, because I, I don't want to miss messages. It's recorded and it's going to get replayed. <laughs> They take minutes. They do take minutes. Yeah. Tom does the minutes. But he's also and running the meeting. The, the sign-in sheet is not a requirement by statute. We do it to help identify people when we're doing the minutes after the fact. They are not a requirement of law. 
So I just want to make sure that they're, they're getting the right information out. Sorry. I'm not saying it's something we, we will definitely do. I just, for future conversation. Mm -hmm. Graham, would you identify yourself, please? Graham, Mink. Um, <clears throat> just going to. There's just a couple of things that I wanted to just touch upon um, and ask the board to consider when reviewing the zoning changes that may come in the future. You know, that it, and you guys touched on it as well that it's a balancing act between trying to provide affordable housing with housing that's you know architecturally pleasing, um, which is a subjective measure in a lot of ways. Um, when you're considering the historic district and where it's going to apply, um, you know, there already is an existing historic district in the downtown that. Uh, would be a good basis to include the historic requirements. Um, I think the board should consider putting this restriction on all properties, not just on commercial properties or multi-family properties, but I think single-family homes and duplexes should also be considered. Um, if the goal is to maintain historic architecture, then I think it should be for all buildings, not just commercial ones. Um, and I think that a lot of the anti-development sediment is, is being projected upon the historic thing, uh, the new section 207, and I'm, that's not how it started when the discussion started six, seven months ago um, at the planning council meeting. So I just want to ask the board to consider our existing historic structures in town and what they look like, size and scale and massing um, and looks. And, and certainly a lot of the things that Etienne touched upon as far as windows um, is accurate, trim size is accurate. Those things can be added and not destroy the project from a cost perspective, but there are other things that would as far as foundation layouts and, and making the buildings smaller. So just, just consider that stuff. Um, demolition, to, to talk to Kathy, you know, any, everything that <clears throat> I personally have demolished has been a single family home that was really beyond repair from an economic standpoint. It was a building that was needed to be torn down and really renovation was not possible. And uh, a couple of them renovation was the plan before we got into it and discovered that it wasn't feasible. So I think that the fear of prominent historic buildings in town that are that are large, especially large ones that are in current currently being used, that there's not economic incentive to demolish those, let alone public sentiment that you know would do that. There's there's smaller buildings that I that I've owned that I've fixed up in the last uh, six months. There's one on Winter Street. It's a historic building that we've renovated completely. Um, there's a couple on Upper Main Street as well. So not every property is a target to be demolished. It's not doesn't work from an economic standpoint. It's not something that you know I personally am looking to looking to do. So I understand there's fear and concern over that. But the development on Bridge Street, you know, was there, the housing that was there was was inadequate, and uh, and that's why it was demolished. Some of the things like the setbacks were a requirement of the town. I did not want to build five feet off the sidewalk. It's a pain in the butt. They ruin the sidewalks. It's dangerous. It's, it's not a fun thing to do. Um, I think that's been addressed or is going to be addressed to allow it to be pushed back a little bit. Um, <coughs> and uh, the meeting the other night, the planning meeting, you know, I, I, I felt that there was a lot of discussion. I, you know, the only um, thing that I really saw that was really, I felt out of line was <coughs> towards the end of the meeting when, when the chair of the conservation board, you know, stood up and started, you know, basically hijacked the meeting to, to start talking. And I didn't stick around to see it. I had to go, unfortunately, but, <coughs> you know, everything else was, uh, was above board and no issues. Um, and I'd like to also back up what Tony said about the rules. It appears that they're great when they're first Created and then as soon as it rains, it seems that they they revert back to pretty rough shape after that. So, you know, if there's some help that can be done with, with road grading to get water off it quicker. Sorry, sorry thank to you. go over it. Thank you. So, anything you, uh, the first part about the planning commission and taking that back to the meeting would be great to the planning commission. Yes, then yeah. I, I will, and I have okay. I just one. All right. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Any other, anybody else have their hand up? Can you introduce yourself? I'm Christine Smith, and I just want to make sure I understand the process here that the planning commission is going to be putting together their proposal. They're going to give it to you. So any feedback that anybody in the community has should be going to the planning commission. And Once you get the proposal, you're going to assume that it is 
okay by the planning commission standards and has been vetted by the community and incorporated the community? No, I think we'll have a I think I would, we'll have a public hearing, right? We have to have one public hearing and vote at the next meeting. Yeah. So at least two meetings. After the after the planning commission does their their steps, then there's also a public hearing on our part. Is that correct? Yeah. Todd? Correct. So the planning council is a public hearing. We'll generally vote the item at the next regular meeting. This is about two, I mean, two years of zoning because of the pandemic. Uh, it's a big zoning change. The select board and trustees have to call public hearings. They have the public hearings and they have regular business meetings where they discuss the polls and vote. So if uh, if the polls will come from planning and doesn't uh, require a change at the select board and trustee level, uh, if it's warned in September and the planning level, it could be the writ of law come. Uh, Thanksgiving or soon after there later before the holidays. Uh, if the select board requires change or the trustee requires changes, which I generally always happen pretty much, then it gets pushed back. We're probably talking about early 2023 for approval. Does that make sense? Okay. So there's several times in front of the planning commission, in front of the, tr the trustees, and in front of the select board. And do we have do we have the date for the public hearing? We don't know yet um, for the zoning bylaw changes. You know, you'll probably get it in October or November, so I guess. Depends okay. what planning does with it. It depends on the public feedback they get to it. So you won't have that until planning gets through their hearing process. Planning's going to approve it and send it to you, teed up for the select board and trustees. Your hearings will likely start before Thanksgiving and could wrap up uh, before, the before the holidays, uh, before New Year. But if the select board makes changes, we can start back at square one, and then you're pushing us into 2023. You miss the construction season. So the point of tonight's session <coughs> discussion is, Tell us any showstoppers now, because otherwise you're going to get what you're getting pretty much. Uh, so mm -hmm. we'd like to get it on the books for the 2023 construction season. If you, we don't find out any showstoppers until it's actually legally worn in front of you, and we miss the building season. So right. just to be clear, if we don't make it, if we want these changes, <coughs> we've got to get keep the process moving, or else we're stuck with the zoning we have now. All right. What if we don't want changes? How do we, how do we, same thing. Same thing. Yeah. Also, I, I mean, I, I'm going to be opening up a can of worm where I'm saying this, but we're elected, we're elected officials. And so speaking for myself, if you would like to email me just a couple bullets of your concerns so I can compile them to have in front of me for um, any hearings. I, I've done that in the past with the, um, um, with the town plan. Um, just bullets would be great. Um, <laughs> Thank you for that. And I I'll, just assume that yeah. like, by the time something gets to you from mm -hmm. the planning commission, it's going to work for you. You have a fair amount of trust in it. Right. Mm -hmm. I would hope. Yeah. Right? right. Yeah. That's the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so any bullet points are going to be wonderful here before the planning closes the hearing. So right. We can do the town planning right. we can do it over and over again from square one. Right. I'd yeah. rather hear the, some public input before we have exactly. the public hearing. We're yeah. So that's not a surprise. The, Extended duration of the town plan to yes. get to the select board the trustees. Right. Uh, they can delete what they can't add, is that correct? Pretty much, yeah. You can you can delete things, leave things on the cutting room floor, I like to say, but you can't make wholesale changes, otherwise, we'll go back to square one. Right. So but it now time. would be the time to add. Correct. Uh, yes. Do you mm -hmm. see any showstoppers, anything you were concerned about? Mm -hmm. Let's address them now so mm -hmm. we can get through the process to get on the books before the holidays. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to miss construction season. And so, sorry, I. Um, this is just housekeeping stuff. When is the next planning council meeting? Uh, Tuesday, not, not a week from tomorrow. Okay. And we'll, it's today. Mm. I'm sorry. And will there be any room on that agenda for any old business or discussion regarding this zoning uh, proposal? There's section 207 is on the agenda. It's already posted. It's posted here, the post office, the library. Some of us don't make those rounds very often. Can we post it someplace else? We're posting it from Porch Forum. We're above and beyond stature requirements. I'm, I'm sorry. I just, I'm frustrated with you know, this question. And no offense to you, Matt. Okay. It's just we've, we've heard this so many times in the last six, eight months. We have increased our locations for posting. We cannot bring people to the postings. What we've spread the word is, I, I mean, far and wide, beyond stature requirements. Social media, we have used every venue available to us besides one door to door. I'm sorry, but there's only so much local government can do to bring people to the table. People need to become civically engaged. You're here tonight, that is fantastic. I love seeing crowds here because we get the input we're looking for. But for local government to, to reach out any further, I just don't know where or how we're going to do this. Engagement's a two-way street. The town website's a great place to go. That's meant to be our one-stop shopping for all information. 
And just go to the town website any question. If you want to get a meeting, town website. Where where would you like to see something posted? Where? Oh, I, you know, I'm, I guess I was just shooting on the tip on that one. Yeah. You know, I'm kind of um, really frustrated about the donations that took place in 2018 that we didn't really find out about until last Saturday. Wow. Um, affecting a large portion of the village and, um, you know, that's positive. You can't go backwards. Well, right. you can. You made a mistake. Mm -hmm. And I think the mistake happened that needs to be corrected in the last year or so. Uh, All right. Okay. Not so, a so. Quick question. I'm still confused on how the process works. So when when Mr. Mink wants to, um, has bought property, wants to put something there, what's the first step? Who does he go to first? He goes, I'm assuming, to Todd to find out the zoning regulations. Okay. They're already and established. Does it go then like to the DRB yes. and then the Planning Commission? No, it goes, it goes the, the Planning Commission has already set up the zoning laws. Okay. And then the developer, correct me if I'm wrong, developer comes in, they want a permit to do such and such on this piece of property. And Todd either grants or denies the permit. If the permit's granted, then they have to go to the DRB to, to have the permit implemented. I might be, not be using the right terms. And then it can go forward from there. So really you need to go to every, if anybody wants to be involved, it's the DRB where, where it first starts. For, yeah. for some projects. depends. Yeah, it depends on what you're looking at. Maybe I would just add that before I'm even interested in a property. I'm just using you as an example. I, 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 I'll give you my. It's more than you were building. Um, I know. I just the one that comes to the meetings takes the use. I don't know why. I I look to the areas of town that are identified in the town plan and by the zoning map to try to find where they want housing, and then I. I find properties in that zone that meet what I can do and make the numbers work so it's feasible to move forward with it. So I'm not just picking a random place that comes on the market and trying to jam 10 pounds of crap in a five pound bag. Well, that's where it just gets confusing because right. you just said not all of the ERB. So as people that want to be involved, you don't even know where to go because I can't tell you how many meetings I've been gone to and I've been told it's not the correct meeting. If it meets sure. the zoning bylaws, you don't have to go to the DRB. Right? Well, most large projects that people in this room care about go to the DRB. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so the, the, the town plan dictates and the zoning map dictates where low density is, where high density is, where high, high density is, what uses are available in that area. And that's what I use to find properties that might work or something. And then it goes to the development review board. And then it's an application to Todd, then it's warned, it goes to DRB. And then they deliberate and decide if it meets the rules. And if it does, then, then you're approved. And if it doesn't, then they make changes. And then there's neighbors. All the immediate neighbors are notified. And when does that have to be I don't know. When is it to kick in? Like for when is it? That's a whole nother thing. I yeah, Act 250 is a whole other thing distinct from the local process. So I was just wondering if. What stage of the game do you go to them? After the local approval okay. at this point. What triggers it for you? Uh, the triggers are different. size, the it's, location. The... It's usually number number of units or size of the development. Okay. Actually, if you use uh, ten acres of development or ten units of development, the trigger. It's more, but he he would be. I like your. I understand your answer. Thank you. But again, I'm just still confused because, like the dog park, that wouldn't go through DRB. So who goes that? Who, who the dog goes? park. So so the dog park was done by the select board. Right. So that was just a select so board. Confusing for the app and the the, the, the property that the dog park is on is town property, so that's why it was done here. We didn't okay. have to go through any permitting process, as you, far as I know. You get on the board here, sit here, and you come here every night. You. <laughs> Start where <laughs> a lot of it is, and not always. I'm making mistakes. Five year countdown. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, do we have any other business? We do. Oh, Sarah has something. Can I put a plug while there's a lot of people here? Um, primary, August um, 9th year. You're not automatically mailed ballots like in the past. So if you want a ballot, email me, contact me, fax, whatever. 
um, plumbing, um, and we will mail you ballots. Also, if you are interested in being a justice of the peace and um, working with me as a board of civil authority member or board of abatement, it's a very different process than anything we've talked about. You have to be elected, and that's done by party caucus. So I think that they're this week, the Democrats and the Republicans I've read on Front Porch Forum are having theirs. So they're nominated by parties. Haven't seen anything from any of the other parties. But if you'd like to run as an independent, you need to get a petition. There's a whole um, website under clerk election candidates that are set up with information or contact me. The deadline is 5 p.m. on August 12th to run. Thank you, Sarah. Don? I move we go into executive session because I find that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body or a person involved at a substantial disadvantage. I make a motion to enter into executive session to discuss the appointment or employment or evaluation of a public officer or employee subject to T1 VSA section 313A3 to include the town administrator Eric Dodge, finance director Tina Sweet, police chief Jason Lanou, and Paula Beattie. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion Thanks passed. everyone for coming. Thanks everyone.